Smith. I am Mark Bernard. Hey! Ho! We are here live, as always, in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard, at the Scum and Villainy Cantina. Put your hands together so the folks at home know you're real. <laughs> this is the place where you could kill a motherfucker, flip a quarter, and be like, sorry for the mess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how are you good, sir? I am great, man. I'm, I've been looking forward to being back in the villainy scum place. Yes, yeah, me too. This is one of my favorite things to do in the world and shit. Uh, but you've got, I'll just cut to the chase, you got a special guest tonight, I don't do. you? I do. I have a special guest for whom I'm going to attempt to do a clean show. Uh, oh my God. I <laughs> know, yeah. I can't, I can't work blue tonight, otherwise I will not hear the end of it. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah, because my mom is in the house. <laughs> she's she's waving like a lunatic. Right up. <laughs> yeah, take your bow, mom. Take your bow. <laughs> that is very very cool. And uh, we were we were out. You know, the green room of this place is neither green nor a room. Um, <laughs> it's the back alley. And uh, so uh, we were standing out back, and I was like, "You must be so proud of your son." He's Come all the way from New Jersey, and he brought you to a back alley in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> um, how sweet, man. How long yeah. is mom in town for? Uh, about a week and a half. About a week and a half. So the kids are on their school breaks, so this was an opportune time. And also, New York is buried in snow and yeah. awful, but out here, it's 76 and sunny. So Now, what role does mom play in you being a you know, nerd and a geek and a guy who likes this kind of stuff? <laughs> she was wonderfully indulgent when I was a kid because she could care less about any of this stuff. It was always, we, is it a Star Wars? All right, fine, we'll go see it. All right, these, these little kittens are cute. They're Ewoks, Mom, I know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Ewoks were kittens? Uh, you know, it's furry. Yeah. They kind of had ears and yub yub, whatever. Uh, she was very indulgent. Sounds like your mom was like, I was dealing with real life. Fuck your Ewok problems. <laughs> yeah, I got no time for this. <laughs> and I told her, no, we're going to come to a, to a Star Wars bar. It's like, oh, like in the Star Wars movie? I'm like, yeah. She's like, really? <laughs> I didn't have to do enough of this when you were nine. Like, well, apparently not, mom. At least you're consistent from nine till now. Oh, yeah. No, you got to stay the course. At some point, it'll break for me. Yay. <laughs> He'll grow up, I'm sure. One day, it's coming. Yeah, no time soon. Um, you don't get to make your journey, uh, which has been incredible, uh, unless she makes her journey, man. So give it up for Mark's mom, for heaven's sake. Yay! <laughs> yeah, she, she did not blanch when it's, I gotta go and buy some D&D &D dice. Don't you have enough dice? We have backgammon in the house. Why do you need more dice? <laughs> I need a dodecahedron, Mom. <laughs> Is that 20 sides? Why do you need 20 sides worth of dice? All right, let's go. <laughs> I had one of those, God bless you, just not with uh, d and I would have never bothered my mother with that. She might have, like, called the police for the D&D shit. <laughs> like, no, I'm a dungeon master. She's like, Don, phone the police. <laughs> Grace. <laughs> Grace. Um, so uh, that's awesome. Your mom yeah. is, is uh, in the house and stuff. And we will try to... Watch our language in a big, bad way. Well, you don't have to. Your mom's not here. Fucking A, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who's going to have to go home for the next nine days. I'm like, did you hear that boy? It's true. There's a certain amount of cursing I have to do per week. It's expected. It's in my contract. So. Um, okay, what else has been going on? I went to Disneyland yesterday. Hey. This is going to sound gross, and I don't want this to sound gross, but I honestly feel it is good advice for anybody going to Disneyland with children. Mm. So you can go to Disneyland any number of ways and stuff, but they won't let you in unless you pay, of course. And uh, it's, you know, it's not, it's not inexpensive. No, um, they get it, you. But it's worth it. You get inside and it's like all the memories of childhood come flooding back. And I went on every ride yesterday, the exception of four rides. In the span of seven hours, we were able to do everything. They still 
hold up. Everything's still legit, still like totally works. The Haunted Mansion is still like a marvel. Uh, it broke down at one point because it's fucking old, maybe. But um, <laughs> it, we were frozen in the best place, that f- dining hall where there's a bunch of shit going Ooh. on. So you, we got, I got to study. We were literally there for five minutes, and I got to study everything, try to figure, you know, my whole life. I'm like, how do they do it and shit? It's a mirror. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had enough time to be like, oh, I see it. Uh, but it's just fucking fantastic. And, you know, this this is the year 2018 where we've seen, you know, like incredible marvels and, and technology has turned us in from, from a society of people to people who are cyborgs. They got fucking robot built into their hand that they live their life by and stuff. But this was such a fucking amazing throwback, like to a period. Wait, I hit a pothole. What the fuck was I just describing? Uh, Haunted Mansion fucking haunted mansion um a throwback to a time when like when they opened it let's say it was 1966 or 67 or something like that this must have been everything like if you were a kid and you had no access there was no internet to have access to or anything like that and you'd never seen a guardian of the galaxy or anything like that it would be fucking fascinating it's i'm 47 i know 48 i know how it all works and now especially because i saw the mirror and i'm still dazzled by it. I'm still like, wow, this is pretty fucking intense and wonderful and stuff. So got to spend the whole day um, and do, did every ride except for fucking four. This is my advice. If you have small children, um, they have a section on the website you can go to, and this is going to sound gross, but you can pay for a VIP. Anybody can be the VIP. You just have to have fucking money. And you pay the park like a certain amount of loot per hour, and you get a minimum set of hours. And then you get somebody in a name tag and a Disney jacket, and you can do anything shy of kill children in the park. <laughs> like, it's incredible. The dude was like the front of the line pass to yeah. everything. So, like, you know, you, you, they take you through the exit of every ride. They put you, like, on a car, and you're off and running, man. It, it's, you're getting Disney history the whole time and stuff like that. History was good enough and shit, but when it came to shit like we got to Space Mountain and it was like a 19 day wait and stuff and he was like, oh, not for us, you know, we fucking went, we went, not only did we go to space, but as we got into our car, the guy was going, you wanna go twice? I said, fuck yeah, man. (laughs) Nobody's ever asked me that. I've been married fucking nearly 20 years. My wife never asked, do you wanna go twice? Like, so I was like, fuck yeah, I wanna go twice. So we finished. And then instantly pulled in, and then they were like, woo, and we went again, man. I was like, oh, I'm the king of Disneyland. It was so fucking wonderful and stuff. So, uh, you know, we were two adults and a, an adult child. Mm. And, you know, we have time and, 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 and you keep experience with Disneyland. So if you know, you go, if you go, you know you're going to wait in some fucking lines and stuff. But that being said, like, it was a breeze, like, for the three of us and shit like that. But I can't imagine, you're allowed to bring up to 10 people in your party. You, st- you gotta buy park tickets, of course, and this is a fee on top of it. But if you had little kids and shit, like standing in those lines, a killer. Jason Mewes just took his kid to Disneyland for the first time. She's a massive fucking Disney fan and stuff. And they hit four rides over the course of the whole day. Cause you know, those lines will fucking kill a kid and then they're hungry and shit and everything breaks down. So if you went with like one of these tour guides and shit, you get right into fantasy land, bam, 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 sometimes twice in a row. And suddenly you're, you've, you've done it. If the kid like, I'm tired, it's like, fuck it, we're done. And you're out of there. <laughs> um, it's pretty, it was pretty fun. And granted, um, you know, it's not like you, you need to put a set aside some loot to do it. But my rationale, because my wife is like, don't do this, this is expensive. And I was like, how often do we fucking go to Disneyland? Like, never. So this is a one-time expense. It's not like I'm going to be like, we're doing this shit every week and stiff. That would be cost prohibitive. But for this one time, and granted there was only three of us, we could have had seven more and it would have you know, ameliorated the cost a little bit more. But it's the way to go. Just look it up on the website. You would never have to wait in a Disneyland line again and shit. And people, I thought people would mean mug us and shit as we got like into a, a car. Because Jason always tells me the story. One time he went to, uh, what's the, it's his Magic Mountain. Is that mm-hmm. the thing that's out here? They went to Magic Mountain with Ben and Matt at the height of Ben and Matt. Like when they were fucking, oh my God, these motherfuckers are going to cure cancer. (laughs) They didn't. Um, (laughs) So he was there like when they went to the park and they got like fucking the royal treatment and stuff without paying or anything because they were just super famous and stuff. And so uh, Jay said they like brought them in front of everybody on lines and he was just like all day long people were like fuck you Affleck 
<laughs> so I was like, I'm never asking for free shit, man, like at the end of the day. So I was waiting for somebody to be like, fuck you, son. Bob was going to be like, I paid a lot of money for this. You know, and you can too. Here's the website. So it's a helpful t uh, tip for anybody. I know people out there are like, I'm planning to bring my kids for the first fucking time. I can't imagine if you have three fucking kids in tow. I had one 19-year-old, nearly 19. She's 18. She'll be 19 in, in a couple months. Fuck. <laughs> So close. Yeah, totally. Well, I was sitting there going, what comes first? My wife's birthday, and I confuse it with, bless you, my daughter's birthday, and, my, and our anniversary is coming up at the end of this month, too. There's a, it's a holiday corridor in our house and shit. I'm not till August. Nobody gives a fuck about me. But right here, this is the space where it's like, you got to remember this thing. Anyway, uh, that's my little inside fucking tip. It's not inside. Anybody could fucking thank you. Uh, figure it out if you go to the like, Disneyland website. But I was blown away by the ease and convenience. And granted, it's not a fucking charity you're paying for it. But if you were to be going to Disneyland with multiple kids, get a posse together and stuff, it's, it's fucking so clean, so incredibly clean. You know and how it, else you achieve it that? cost you, yes. What? You be a member of the press. What, they do that? Yeah. Like the did first, they do that for you? They did it for me the first time I went. I was out here working for The Hollywood Reporter, and Disney called me and said, hey, so we redid The World of Color. We would love you to come and write about it. Right. And I said, yes. I don't care about The World of Color at all. But Disney said, would you like to come to the park and see everything? Like, hell yeah, I do. And mom was making her first trip out here. It was like the first summer that we were here. And so my son was, now he's 13, so he would have been eight. My daughter was nine and a half. And their first time at Disney was your first, that time at Disney. Whereas, Where it's like, you've got a studio host. Would you like to do the Cars ride again? Absolutely we would. Would fuck. you like me to hold your seat while you get food? Yes, we would. Would you like me to hold your dick for you, sir? Yes, I would. Yes. I, uh, With your it, kids going, why, Dad, why? Yeah, all right, so we're 22 minutes in. Yeah. And I already, I, it wasn't gonna last. I tried so hard. The mouth on this reprobate. <laughs> Who raised this kid? But, and so now, Every time my kid goes to the amusement park, he's like, is it going to be like Disney? I'm like, no, it's not going to be like Disney. <laughs> That's the only problem. That's it's the downside. Like, now, if somebody was like, hey, want to go to Disneyland? I'd be like, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Are you paying? Yeah, like, I don't know if I can stand in a line ever again <laughs> for anything. Yeah, but it was lovely. And you're right. Like, that, that sense of like, what do you, how do you get to the front of this line again? I'm special, man. I don't know about you. Why are you not at the front of the line? Not I'm me. fancy. Bless you. Not me. I'm, I'm content to be like, I paid for it. <laughs> Through the fucking nose. But like, it's Disney. They'll get me in the end anyway. So, <laughs> just handing it over my money. Um, that was uh, this week. What else did I do? I'm up to, I lost 22 pounds so far since my heart attack. Thank you. Um, and I'm in a place with food that's like completely different. Like now I'm not even bitter about it. Like, oh, I fucking miss food and shit like that. My wife ate a pizza this week, right? And she was just like, I feel cruel, but I really want a pizza. I was like, oh my God, I'm trying to accomplish something here. So don't worry, but I'm locked and loaded and stuff. And pizza's not the thing that's going to knock me off. So go crazy. Uh, and she fucking did it, the bitch. And, uh... <laughs> Oh, and it was, it smelled amazing. I had garlic all over it and shit like that. And I was, and the, suddenly it's weird the things you miss when you're not really eating. Like, suddenly I was like, I just want to taste the flour at the bottom. <laughs> like, you know how pizza's got like that loose flour dust and shit? I was like, just let me lick the bottom of that pizza. <laughs> but still st held steadfast. Did she dab some of the grease behind her ears? Like, <laughs> yeah. Hey. She's like, come and get it. You know? <laughs> she wore a pizza slice bikini. <laughs> um, no, no, fuck. It was, uh, I, I'm honestly like, I'm in a place with food where I'm not like, oh my God, I miss it. I'm okay to be away from it for a while and stuff. Doesn't bother me yet. Uh, knock wood until one day when it does and stuff. Um, so, but yeah, so far so good. Program fucking working out and stuff. Today yeah. I was down like three quarters of a pound and I was like, fuck because i like the day before i dropped two pounds and stuff like that so it's you know it's like this i'm plateauing at places and then dropping in others and stuff so it's been an interesting process but i'm nearly at the halfway point the doctor was like lose lose 50 pounds i lose three more pounds like i'm fucking halfway there um and maybe that's where i'll fucking stay <laughs> you know? done i did it fuck the doctor's advice i know what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I'm gonna keep going. And it's weird, people keep asking me, like I keep getting emails and 
and like invites and stuff from vegan organizations. Um, Cause they're like, hey, we hear you don't like meat no more. Uh, and I'm like, why does this keep happening? But I found out my kid keeps putting me forward. <laughs> Like a pyramid scheme of she, vegan places. Like. She wants to shame me into staying vegan. Like she's just like everybody knows you're vegan now. So if you eat meat, it's gonna be a big disappointment for a lot of people. You know, do it for the people. <laughs> the community needs you. Totally. I'm like, oh my god. All right, fucking Burgermeister, Meister daughter. Like fucking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you know, it doesn't really bother me so far. I haven't really thought about it. Where I'm like, oh fucking, oh, we need a fuck. If I saw a cow, I'd bite his dick off. Like. <laughs> Nothing. I really now have That's this a different dis- issue, but no. yeah. <laughs> it's a little unhealthy. I, I now have this distance from it where I'm like, oh, I don't like turkey as much as I like salt that I put on the turkey, which I put on a fucking ton, or gravy. Like mm. if I have gravy, it's just like I'm eating 90% gravy, 10% fucking turkey. So now I'm like, well, I wasn't really a big fan anyway, so it's not going to be that hard to lose. As long as they don't take away peanut butter and jelly, they can take the fucking rest, man. I could live off that. That's fucking vegan. (laughs) Do you know that? Now I do. And knowing is half the battle. That's my hope. That's the the future. In my future, somewhere two, three months down the road, there's a fucking fat ass peanut butter and jelly sandwich that's just gonna be like come back baby <laughs> um all right i think that's all i got you got any upfront stuff uh i saw some movies Ooh, what i saw pacific rim uprising which i'm sorry sounds like a porno to me <laughs> <laughs> every part of that just sounds fucking filthy but uh how was it i liked uh, the first one. And yeah. I know I got a lot of points. Everybody's like, it's new IP. They created a new IP in a new world. Uh, this is continuation now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's daffy and stupid and a whole lot of fun. It is exactly what I wanted it to be, which was giant robots punching each other in the face. Yes. And if that doesn't make you happy, then I don't want to know you. <laughs> That's just the name of that song. Uh, it, is a, it is the fucking uh, the, the, uh, ingredients of happiness. I, it launched number one this week, yes? It did. It was the first thing to dethrone Black Panther. Um, by how much? Um, like $4 million. It made like 27 and Black Panther was 23 Black Panther's still making all the money, though. All of every dime. Uh, it just rose to number five on the domestic all-time list. Which is ridiculous. That's fucking and huge. Number one superhero movie of all time because in America it beat mm. the Avengers. But oh my God, man. Can you imagine? Like number five on the all time list. Uh, does that bode huge for Avengers or no? Or does it like people go like, oh, I just watched a superhero movie. There's no fucking way. It's like almost like getting a Black Panther sequel hidden inside an Avengers movie. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's where it helps because Avengers is always going to make all the money. Like, right. it was always going to open huge and stay huge and internationally just dominate. But there's a segment of the Black Panther audience that traditionally doesn't go see these movies, like my mom, who was like, sure, I, it's a phenomenon, it's a movement, I have to take part of this, I have to see what this is all about. She's not gonna technically go see Infinity War, but right. now she might. Because like a third of it's in Wakanda, and hey, there's the Dormelage again, and hey, here's the things that I loved before. See, that's how they get you. The first taste is free. The first taste is free. <laughs> and then you just want a little more. Yeah, like just they come go back, back for to when Wakanda. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fiending. <laughs> um, yeah, that's smart. It, it truly is. Uh, it might be the situation. Is remember after Avengers, Iron Man three took a huge jump. Now Iron Man yeah. three is a wonderful movie. Don't get me wrong, but. It seemed to benefit substantially yeah. from, from the Avengers. You know, he was, was very able much to like do Avengers 1.5. Kind of. Yeah. And that's what it feels like, oddly enough, that <laughs> Avengers feels like Black Panther 1.5, uh-huh. um, based on how successful Black Panther was and continues to be. Jesus. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, Uprising was totally fun. How is, uh, is John Boyega? He's good. I was upset to find out that... This motherfucker's lost in space, man. He's like either in Star Wars or in Pacific Rim. Yeah. He, they don't let him be in movies where he's like, I'm just a dude who's a, got a job in a law firm and stuff. He's <laughs> always so fighting larger than life. I saw him on, when I was in Disney. I went on the Star Tours ride because I was like, ooh, did they update it for Last Jedi? They did. Ooh. There's a fucking scene where you go to Crate, like, you know, with the fucking Snow Walkers and the Gorilla Walkers and stuff like that. Um, and he's, he's one of the guys in it. He pops up and he's like, what are you doing here, Star Tours? I was like, 
oh my <laughs> god they roped the real talent into this because oh, yeah. i went on the submarine ride which is like finding nemo and when they hit uh marlin and dory mm -hmm. it's not it's like albert brooks's younger brother yes you know? and like ellen's nancy degeneres yes <laughs> <laughs> so it's just slightly off brand and you can kind of hear it in their voices and stuff so i appreciate the fact that they got the real people to like because it took what 10 minutes to be like can you stand here and pretend you're on talking to the star tours yeah. people god bless you I think the Harry Potter ride and Universal upped the game that way. Explain. Because they got all the kids back. They get Ron and Hermione and Harry and Hagrid. They're all, they all show up to be in this like fancy baloney. And they got them just before they all turned 40 and shit. Like, <laughs> right before they were done with the Harry Potter years. Um, okay, what else you see? Uh, I saw Isle of Dogs. Oh, the, the Wes Anderson, the Wes Anderson movie. Movie. How is it? Pooch movie. Uh, I saw is, a screening, like they had some screening somewhere mm -hmm. where people were allowed to bring their dogs, which I thought was adorable. It's adorable. I would not go to that because I would die slowly. Um, Are I'm, you allergic? I'm allergic. <laughs> so it's like, oh, this is great. Why is my chest so tight? I just did this. Not again. Um, well, dogs can sn sniff out health problems, so maybe they'll all be like, yeah, this one. <laughs> He's going down. Lap dance. Um, it's cute. It's super cute. It's a boy and his dog movie. And it's, it's, it's made with a lot of love and a lot of care, and it's mm. super precise and impeccable and artisanal, the way that Wes Anderson is. Um, artisanal. What a great explanation of the films he does. It's like marmalade. It's like organic marmalade. Every one of those movies. I'm sure Wes Anderson's somewhere like, I thought I was worth a lot more than marmalade, but, but it's a nope. pretty good accurate <laughs> description. Not to say like, I don't know, like people like marmalade and stuff. They do. But it is artisanal, to absolutely say the least. Um, it, is, it is under fire somewhat for cultural appropriation. In that from the dog community? From the, the dog community are absolutely furious about this. <laughs> They're like, nobody asked us. <laughs> but Where yeah. is this Isle of Dogs? <laughs> we want to be there. <laughs> we love dogs, too. Um, is, it, in, is it like titular... It is. There is an island an of, dogs. of dogs. Yes. A bunch of different breeds? Uh, yeah. Like, was there a Dashkin? No. Not I'll that never I never get my fucking money. <laughs> <laughs> really? How do you leave a wiener dog off, man? I don't know, man. It's a trash island. And I guess wiener dogs are better than that. It's artisanal. <laughs> it's artisanal. <laughs> but, yeah, um, so it's good? It's good. There was some criticism, you know, from especially significantly Asian American culture writers and critics who are calling to task the fact that this is a movie that is set in Japan, but none of the characters, none of the main characters are Japanese. They're all dogs, but they're all voiced by the, like, the Wes Anderson army of players. So it's your Bill Murray's and your Brian Cranston's and your Edward Norton's, and they're all white actors playing these dogs, and that's who you empathize with in the movie. You're here for the dogs. It's set in Japan, there are Japanese humans, but every time they speak, it's either translated or it's subtitled or it's in some cases not translated at all. So the distance between you and those characters is significant because it's the language barrier. And so the, the empathy of this movie is not with the Japanese people, it's with the dogs. And then it becomes, then why set it in Japan? That's my, that was gonna be my question. Like, was it necessary right. to set it in Japan? Kind of not really. Like, this could have been Iowa if all we're gonna do is listen to dogs. Really? Yeah, like there's nothing specific so it about it. it like being a very Twee decision? It seems very a very Anderson like- Anderson type decision? Yes, like I wanna paint like cultural wallpaper behind my drama, but my drama is not about people of this culture or right. characters of this culture, um, which is a fair criticism. It is a fun movie, and I'm glad I saw it. I took my kid. He kind of dug it. It's weird, but he swung with the weird. But I see... Your kid wasn't like, this is fucking cultural reappropriation. <laughs> what is this? This is nonsense. Yeah. I cry foul. That's Well, I would imagine if you saw it in Japan, it'd be voiced by local famous stars. Yeah, as I mean, opposed to the Wes Anderson players and stuff. But, but, so why, why are folks mad? Because think it's here? They're mad because it's here. They're mad because... You know, the, the, where the film places its emphasis, where it places its focus, is not indicative of the culture where the film is set. Right. And so why are we here if it's not going to be about these people? Then it becomes just, again, just tinsel on a tree that doesn't belong did there. At any point while you're watching the movie, did that bother you? Once or twice. Really? Like Once you or bumped twice. into it as well? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't happen that often. Like, I'm not going to say that you have to be looking forward to see it because... 
you know, all the human characters are Japanese except for one white girl who's like Greta Gerwig. And you're like, what is she doing here? And why is it Greta Gerwig? And why is she the only one I understand? Like, do none of these Japanese people speak English? Really? Okay. Sure. Yoga Ono doesn't speak English. She's got a voice in there. I bet she speaks English. You know, like, Wes Anderson never anticipated that. No. No. Couldn't have seen it coming. No. But for all of that, I kind of dug the movie. But I see, I see the issues behind it. How is the, aside from the issues, how's the animation? Lovely. Is it, like, lovely. better than Fantastic Mr. Fox? or It's, it's better than like, that. It's, you know, it's, it's not a quantum leap better because it's still going for that, like, handmade feel. Right. It's not as good as, like, Kubu and the Two Strings. It's not as good as a Leica movie. Right. But it's still really strong. Still really strong. He's building a little cottage industry of, you know, of course, just Wes Anderson yeah. movies, but the, he's got the, an animation game on the side. Yeah. It's kind of fascinating. Cartoons uh, for smart people. Hmm. I saw Krypton, so the pilot for Krypton. The fuck, really? Yeah. Is that out? It's out. It, it happened? It aired last week. It was the third most viewed pilot, I think, of sci-fi's history. Or something to that. <laughs> what a weird honor. I know. We're number three. We're number three. <laughs> here for bronze the bronze. Right here. <laughs> um, well, that's huge, man. How was it? Um, given that it's a show that doesn't really need to exist. Yes. <laughs> I mean. Which could describe many shows, which but could I get be, you. But, you know, it's, it's a little bit like Gotham in the, do I really need to see baby Bruce Wayne? Like, do I need to see what Krypton is like before people can fly well, and shoot stuff in their eyes? Well, at least they're showing Bruce Wayne. Krypton's not even going to show you Kal-El, right? No, no. But for all of that, for, despite the fact that it has a somewhat flawed premise, the execution is actually really solid. Like, the guy who was playing Seg-El... Um, that's the grandfather? That's the grandfather. Uh, you know, sort of young, handsome Brit, because everybody's British on Krypton for reasons that feel weird. But okay, why not? <laughs> Um, he's really good. Paula Malcolmson is in it. She's great. It looks pretty solid. They, they are recasting some ideas of who the, the fabric of the Superman universe is. Like, for example? For example, Seg L's romantic interest, uh, her last name is Zod. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a Romeo and Juliet thing. A bit of a Romeo and Juliet thing. Um, but they're doing everything they can to also remind you that you know, Superman is going to show up at some point like nine years from now. Because Adam Strange, spoilers, is in the pilot. That excited me very much when I saw the commercial. Yeah. That kind of information, that leaked. He says that at one point. Yeah, like, I'm Adam Strange. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the concept of Adam Strange, uh, Ran, Ron's champion. Um, and this is a guy who's got, like, he was handled so well by Alan Moore years ago, I think in Swamp Thing. He, kid, uh, it, he's, uh, he exists on the planet Ron for six months at a time. He could be teleported there by the Omega Beam, if I remember correctly. No, the, what is it? Zeta Beam. Thank you, Zeta Beam. Omega Beam is dark side. Um, Zeta Beam gets him to that place for a period of time where he was Rand's champion, Ron's champion, wears the outfit and shit mm. like that, um, fights the Thanagarians for, on behalf of Ron, and ha is, is like engaged or sometimes married to the princess of Ron. But periodically, the Zeta Beam wears off and he fucking goes right back to Earth, where he's trapped and has to find the next location of the Zeta Beam. Such a great concept and could make a very cool mm. quasi futuristic movie and stuff, but it's nice that somebody dug him out of mothballs and stuck him <laughs> into a show. That's a cool idea. Yeah, like he gets to be, you know, the, the he provides the, the Polaroid from Back to the Future, which is basically, Marty, when you disappear from this picture, the future has changed irrevocably. What is the picture? Uh, it's it's Kalel's cape. He comes and brings back the red cape and says, if this disappears, then the future is altered to a point of no return. Oh, my God. I just got chills. I'm about to cry. <laughs> oh, my God. That works. That fucking works. Got, really? And like the bottom of it, the hem is like a little drippy. So it's also like Beauty and the Beast, the rose that's in the thing. Like and they get to do that the whole season. All season. She's going to be like, look at the cape. What's the cape doing? It's fucking good, man. I'm it, in. Fucking, it is. They show Brainiac? Uh, they do. At the very tail end of it. They're like, because uh, that's. Ultimately, the reason why Adam Strange has to come back to help Segel stay on the path is Brainiac is also traveling through time, Terminator style, to kill off Clark Kent's grandfather so that Clark never becomes Superman. So this Brainiac in their world 
is Brainiac from the future come back to the past? And yeah. So he's not like I control. I'm from the. I control Krypton like it was in the cartoon. Right. He's Superman's nemesis in the future, so mm-hmm. he comes back to the past to kill him. Yeah, T one thousand style. I'm fucking in, man. You did a better job of selling it than the trailer. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> that sounds pretty dope. Yeah, it's like they did everything they could to help compensate for the fact that. Does anybody want a Superman show that doesn't have Superman in it? Does anybody want a no flights, no tights, no guy show? Uh, so let's put everything we possibly can about Superman in it. Like the minute they say Fortress of Solitude, you're like, what? Yeah, okay. I thought this was going to suck, but all right. They do Fine. that on Supergirl all the time. They bring you to the Fortress of Solitude yeah. on Supergirl. I mean, this Supergirl has been gone for a few weeks, though. Yeah. I think it's coming back this next week or something like that. Flash is also off the air for a minute, but. It comes back in, I think, two weeks, and it's the episode that I made. And Jay Ooh. and I have a bit part in the episode. Um, so he, he reminded me the other day. He's like, I just saw online that we're in the fucking flash. I was like, you lived it. Yes. Like, <laughs> we were there. <laughs> it happened. Um, but yeah, they, I love it on Supergirl whenever they bring up any mythology. You're like, that's the thing. They'll get me just by bringing up mythology or make a yeah. reference or something like that. I mean, um, but it sounds like, is, that sounds like seriously decent storytelling. It's like, I'm set in. on the bottle city of Candor before what? Krypton is bottled. <laughs> really? Candor's in it as well? Yeah, that's where it's set. That's the King's Landing of Krypton. But it's not the bottled city yet. No, it's just Candor. It's just Candor. You know, like Candor. Before they fucking bottle. Pre bottling. So we know the future. Oh, fuck. It's free range Candor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh my god, I'm fucking in. It must be up on iTunes. I could watch I'm it sure, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tonight, Roseanne comes back. Are you excited? I, I'm a massive fan of that show. Uh, you know, season nine was weird, but, uh, <laughs> but still, there are moments in season nine which are wonderful. Um, her winning the lottery in the open ep- episode, Jackie's reaction is like one of the, uh, the best TV comedic scenes ever produced. And when they wrap the show and she does her monologue and talks about being a writer and stuff like that, it's incredibly moving. Dan, you know, they said mm-hmm. was dead. Now Dan is not dead, which is totally fucking smart. You need John Goodman uh, as Dan Connor. But it, it, it was not without its merits, season nine. Uh, this seems, all the press has been about, you know, uh, Roseanne Connor loves Trump and so does Roseanne herself. Mm. So I'm hoping that the show is little more than, than kind yeah. of easy partisanship, political discourse and whatnot. I um, sure would like it to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. It's on tonight, so I, can't, I, I imagine like every show you'll be able to mm. download it in the morning or something like that. But I'm looking forward to it. I'm rooting for it. I always thought that was such a fucking fantastic show, a real slice of Americana and a world I absolutely recognize there was a move a reason that lasted as long as it did and had the ratings that it did and stuff so i hope to christ they can reconnect and do just a modern version of that but you know right away i'm like (laughs) well they never really talked about politics on the old one you know there were some political situations but like it never went into that place but it seems like they're going to lean on that pretty heavily yeah i mean some of the ads were a little troubling where it was like abc the family as you remember it like, look at this parade of white people. This is what family is, middle America. That was my fucking problem with it, too. I was like, I don't recognize these white people. <laughs> it's like, oh, throttle back, ABC. I get it. But especially during a commercial for while on Blackish. <laughs> like, oh, hey, ah, maybe nah. Um, I'll be watching that. And now I'm going to watch uh, Krypton. You Do it. sold it, man. I was kind of in the bag when they showed... Uh, uh, Brainiac, but fuck, man, you, you did a much better job of explaining it. That is, that is what I do. All right, that's I all we got for opening fix banter? Fix it or break it. That is all we got for opening banter. Oh, my God. Then we're going to take this moment on Fat Man on Batman to open the utility belt and pull out all the news that's fit to print. Mark Bernardin did the very heavy lifting of reading the internet. And so... <laughs> it's really hard, you guys. We're going to talk about the shit that Mark found. Uh, take it away, Mark Bernardin. Give it up for Mark Bernardin with the news. <laughs> Woo! News things. Uh, do you remember when it was announced, like, I don't know, a year ago, that Donald Glover and his brother Stephen were making a Deadpool animated show yes, for FX? Yes, It was one of the many things that Donald Glover was attached to that looked very cool. Yeah, uh, not so much anymore, though. What happened? Uh, FX pulled the plug on it. What? Yeah. Now, 
Does this have FX? So that's Fox, which mm-hmm. is now going to be Disney. Does that have anything to do with any of that stuff? Uh, apparently with the sale not. of Fox to Disney? Apparently not. Uh, the statement, I'm sure you can read through some of these lines, due to creative differences, FX, Donald Glover, Stephen Glover, and Marvel Television have agreed to part ways on Marvel's Deadpool animated series, the network said in the statement. FX will no longer be involved with the project. FX and Marvel have an ongoing relationship through our partnership on Legion, which will continue. Yes. So wait, what? Yeah, creative differences is what happened. What do you, you think know that, how that comes goes. down to? Who, well, he wanted to make a good show, and they're like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, the, the Glover boys wanted to make a very specific show, and FX was like, nah, we're not doing that. Or probably Big Fox said, no, see, Deadpool 2 is coming out, and we don't want any competing versions of what Deadpool is, and you're going too far astray, and so... Oh, really? That, that's my it? theory, is that they, were, they wanted to, to push and explore and discover stuff. And you watch Atlanta, you see that he's a very inquisitive storyteller. And Atlanta is on FX? Mm-hmm. So, wow, it's weird for them to be like, yeah, we're not going to go forward. We want to be in business with you, just not this business with you. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe I mean, I'm sure Marvel. he's happy as hell. Like, that Atlanta show is insanely well received. Oh, yeah. I mean, he won an Emmy for it. And they're, and they're not, like, telling him what to do on that show, apparently. Yeah, but, I mean, maybe it's Marvel, maybe it's FX, maybe it's Fox, but... Uh, clearly, they were doing something that didn't make somebody happy. Somebody with the keys. That's a bummer, but he's so fucking busy. I'm sure on some level, he's just like, whew, a break. <laughs> like, you know, he gets to breathe and stuff. Um, he's very creative and always has, like, not only his own projects, like the Childish Gambino stuff, mm-hmm. uh, to work on, but, like, people snap him up all the time for movies now. Yeah. Uh, and he's got fucking Lando Calrissian to go out uh-huh. there and start being. When does that movie happen? That movie's in, like, four or five weeks. May? God damn it. So is that after Infinity War? Yeah. So Infinity yeah. War is the next one or Deadpool? Infinity War is next and then Deadpool and then Solo. Such a great time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. What else we got? Uh, speaking of Deadpool, the trailer, the full trailer for Deadpool 2 came out. Did you watch yes, it? Yes, of course. Um, look, I thought the other trailer was pretty amazing. Felt like a full trailer as well, but this they showed a lot more, and he actually said X Force, which was kind of <laughs> cool. Um, fucking Rob Liefeld must be like, Cha-ching! <laughs> Pay that so man many. His Not only is money. Deadpool his, but isn't Domino his? Isn't Cable his? Mm-hmm. Isn't X Force his? That's incredible. Good for him, man. Yeah, I mean, he's got to fill all those pouches with something, so it's all money. <laughs> 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 Give me my money. Um, the film went uh, it tested like it's been screening for test audiences and apparently Deadpool they still do that? they still do I don't even know why they bother especially for a movie like that it's like do you really have to test Deadpool 2? like I I imagine all you have to do is come close to the original and you've made everybody happy Um, no they tested it apparently I mean and you have way more experience with this than I have because I've never made a movie nor tested anything in front of other people uh, but it scored uh, 98 in recent oh test screenings. Oh, my God. In the top two boxes? Yeah. That movie's going to make all the money. <laughs> uh, top two boxes is a score that they really care about when you do those test screenings, and that is uh, the combination of the scores that are excellent and very good, because um, generally those people on the exit polls also indicate that they will strongly recommend it to friends mm-hmm. and that believe it or not you know is still part of the fucking game word of mouth so um that score 98 in the top two boxes like i think the highest i ever scored at a test screening i think we got an 89 in the top two boxes on jay and silent bob strike back um so 98 holy fuck that's astounding yeah. and the first one got a 91 which shows you that this is better apparently according yeah, to testing maybe <laughs> I mean, that'll be remain to be seen. But, you know, now you're dealing with brand awareness. Right. Like, right away, going in, everyone's like, I, this is what I need in a Deadpool movie. And it sounds like they fucking delivered on the promise of the first one. And the first one was a promise of, like, here you go. Here's a great movie. Not even, like, the future looks like this. Just, like, check it out. We finally got to do this after fucking years of Fox being no. So I imagine, man, it's going to not be easy to knock it out the park, but it's like, just deliver again, and you got yourself a willing audience that's just fucking ready, and nobody's taking up the space 
like they are in terms mm-hmm. of like we're still seeing a lot of superhero movies but he's the only one fucking you know essentially pulls his dick out like that's the <laughs> magic of that character so uh they, they they're gonna be alone in that fucking space they're gonna own it man i can't imagine when the next r-rated deadpool movie is gonna be or r-rated comic book movie in general is gonna be especially now that the disney fox deal yeah. seems like it's about to go through for reals uh deadpool 2 just underwent uh six days of reshoots why um, to I mean, like it's too good. <laughs> Could we make it like 10% <laughs> less good? 98, fuck, we wanted a 95. <laughs> um, but apparently part of it was two hours worth of work in L.A. for a secret cameo. And nobody knows what that cameo is. Uh, not Stan Lee. I mean, I'm sure they took care of that <laughs> If they could on. catch Stan out, yeah. finally. Um, well, God, I wonder what now. Again, Fox Disney deal makes this interesting is it a marvel universe character a movie mm. universe like marvel extended universe or what are they calling it marvel cinematic mm. universe yeah. um maybe it's one of those characters it, it would be hilarious if at the end of deadpool 2 he's trapped into a box and air jettisoned off the back of a cargo plane he lands in wakanda <laughs> was was i them that's what i would do right <laughs> they could certainly cure that face of his um <laughs> Another broken white boy for them to fix. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, wow. I wonder what it'll be. I mean, and it when could is be this? Hugh this is after Infinity War? Uh, yes. After Infinity War. It won't be Hugh Jackman. It's got to be somebody fucking special. Like it's got, and Hugh Jackman was special, but they kind of did a version of that already, right. didn't they? Um, Patrick Stewart? No, I don't think it's going to be... I don't think it's going to be Fox Universe, man. I, I, guarantee, I can't guarantee it. I bet you... Smells like it might be the, <gasps> like, oh my God, fucking a Marvel character, a Marvel Cinematic Universe character showed up. Might even, maybe not Spider-Man, but fucking like Robert Downey Jr. would be very at home in a brief cameo in a, in a Deadpool movie. Um, what if it's Ben Grimm? <laughs> I can't stand because I just came. <laughs> Oh my God, that'd be amazing. Fox still technically has the Fantastic Four. And they over-delivered like that? That'd be mm. fantastic. Either way, movie sounds like it's going to be great. looks fantastic as well. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Marvel, Chris Evans has uh, made it unequivocal that he is done after Avengers 4. Yeah, yeah. That is a bummer because he fucking did great things with that role, but I honestly feel like that has a lot to do with the story they're telling. Right. They're not telegraphing it now. They're fucking writing it in the sky. Like, get ready to lose your heroes. <laughs> so, I think he's, he's, you know, his moving on isn't like, I'm fucking done with this shit. I think it's right. changing face of the Marvel Universe. But it's cinematic also, universe. tellingly, not after Infinity War. It's after four. It's after four. So, it seems as if Cap is not the dude who dies in Infinity War. Unless that's just something to say to throw us all mm. off the scent or Could something be. like that. Could be. Um, but but told, yeah, that's a, that's a bummer. He's, and he grew into that role so well and made that character interesting and, and believable and, and stuff. I mean, he was always good, right? He was good as the torch mm-hmm. as well. But boy, he did great things with that character. And they surrounded him with great material. But he, I, I will miss him in that role. But it sounds like they might like go a different way way anyway in terms of like Steve Rogers can die somebody else can pick up the mantle and move on they got two capable characters in that world already with uh, uh, the Falcon and fucking Bucky mm-hmm. so I, I don't know that would be ballsy and think about it it's how satisfying that would be on a story level of like you never got tired of that character it yeah. was never like oh Captain America 12 fuck this shit <laughs> um, he looks so old he should go back in the ice but the uh now it's like you'll have fond memories of some great fucking movies and if they need that mantle to carry over somebody else can wear it and still be you know in the marvel cinematic universe but let's be honest they now have a fucking toy chest full of characters that they didn't even scratch from their own ip and now they've got all the other characters back your fantastic four and your mutants and stuff like that with the x-men world so you could just move forward. Could be the some world where we all remember Captain America. Oh, remember they did those movies? That was before they did the fucking Gambit movies. That's reaching far, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Anything's possible. <laughs> um, but there's also, I mean, we're living in a science fiction construct anyway, where there's magic and science and outer space and aliens and infinity stones and 
nobody stays dead in science fiction Very unless true. somebody wants them dead in science fiction. So just because this is the last time we see him now doesn't mean in five years they don't crack another Steve Rogers out of ice and say, look, we found him again. And he could also, like, you know, do cameos. Yeah. If they do flashbacks or something like that or, you know, fucking magical moments of some sort. Like, there's some time travel concerned in these Avengers pictures, aren't there? Um, now that they're introducing Captain Marvel, not in, the, in uh, Infinity War, but of the uh, of not titled, as yet untitled Avengers 4, isn't, like, her character playing a role, I read? I'm pretty sure. I mean, we have a time stone. We have, we have the, the built-in reason why time can, can collapse on itself. Right. And also Coulson is going to be in the Captain Marvel movie. I saw that. Yeah. They announced that uh, 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 Clark, Greg, uh, Greg and uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Lee Pace, who mm. played Ronan the Accuser. And there's a third one from Marvel Past. Mm. Who? Jimon Huntsu. Yeah, Jimon Huntsu, who yeah. was in the... Thank you, Big Daddy. Uh, Star was, who? Yes, yeah, where he's like, come on, man. Um, I love that. That, that such a payoff to that joke when at the fucking third <laughs> act, he's like, Star-Lord, and he goes, finally. <laughs> His fucking face lights up. Um, but those three, I mean, unless they cast him to play completely different people, which you really couldn't do with, with Coulson. He's yeah. fucking recognizable in that world. Those are three characters that are in those movies dead. Yep. So I guess the movie's set in the 80s or something like that. 80s or 90s. 80s and 90s, so I don't know, maybe that's how they bring him in, or she's going back and forth in time or something like that. I, it remains to be seen. What's that? That's one of my comic books. You get yo. to sign it. I get to sign this one. I got one! <laughs> <laughs> it's not. I gotta, I gotta you, up you do it up, man. Soak it in. You seeing this, Mom? Pride. Boom. Ta-da. For those listening at home, what is it that you just signed? Uh, I signed the first graphic novel, Genius. It's the first arc in the book that I'm constantly writing for Top Cow and Image. Mm. Uh, yeah, so woohoo! Yay! Um, You're welcome! There sadly is one last comic book store to vend uh, your trade paperback. I know. We just all discovered this week, those of us here in Los Angeles, that perhaps one of the greatest comic book stores that ever lived, uh, Meltdown is closing its doors after 25 fucking years, man. Yeah. A quarter of a goddamn century. Brick and mortar uh, establishment. Legendary, not just for the class and quality of books and, and merchandise they uh, carried, but for expanding constantly. Like, that was always inspiring to me about that place. Like, he added baby melt, clothes for kids, and then, of course, the, uh, you know, Nerdist nerd melt. Meltdown, mm -hmm. nerd, melt, uh, nerd Melt, the theater and stuff where it became like this fucking you know, backdoor comedy club as well. Uh, an incredible use of that space. And then from what I understand, from what I read, it's some sort of like, they want to build a high rise. Yeah. Or some Condos, situation. retail, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, um, and at the same time, he's just like, look, just time to move on, try some other adventure or something like that. But such a great store. Uh, one that like, I would always steal ideas from and bring back to my own store because I was like, this fucking place is amazing and shit. Um, sad to see her go, man. Yeah, like it was a, it was a clubhouse yeah. in the best way that you could go there and, and much like Scum and Villainy, you went and you found your people. And your people were there and they were reading comics, they were buying comics, they were listening to comedy and podcasts and all kinds of amazing stuff and they loved books and they loved people who created books and other people who read books. Yeah. Like, it's, it's sad to see it go. It is. It's a bummer. So they've opened until what? I think it's like April. Until Friday. So if yeah. you're here in town, you got a chance uh, to walk in and, and help them out and buy some stuff to empty out their stock. Last chance to see a great place. A pop cultural hallmark, man. It's really a shame that they're going away. Golden Apple's still around, though. Don't forget. <laughs> On Melrose, Golden Apple's still here. Yeah. Both of them were, I remember, like, Golden Apple in the... Uh, 90s, like they created a character, Flaxen, mm -hmm. who was like their kind of logo, and there was a book, like comic book series based on the character. And what I liked about um, Meltdown is they created their own logo guy too, that mm -hmm. alien looking character. I always thought that was great, and I was, I was telling fucking Walter Flanagan, 
we need a little mascot for Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash. He's like, Jay and Silent Bob are the mascots. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't thought about that. <laughs> um, yeah. What else we got? Uh, Frank Miller is still making comics. What's more, Good. he just signed a five-project deal with DC Good. to make more comics for them, one of which will be a Carrie Kelly YA miniseries. Oh, fuck. That's fantastic. Yeah. YA, you said? Yeah. He wants to... It's thrilling. Frank Miller's going to write for tweens? Well, you know, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, Miller will be writing our young readers graphic novel starring Carrie Kelly. Uh, will be illustrated by Ben Caldwell, who I'm not sure. And then he's also doing a Superman Year One and a Batman Year One. No, we already did that. Um, yeah, I mean, we all read that. But yes, I mean, Super- shit, the Carrie Kelly thing is enough. Yeah, that's, that's huge. pretty big news. Like Robin from him again. I'll take it. Uh, and that character who they, you know, he's, she's been in all his Dark Knights, but you can go tons of places. They've never really explored that character. Have a good time with Carrie Kelly. Not, not in a dirty <laughs> way. Just have, like, that character's fun as fuck. And to do a YA book makes a lot of sense. Yeah, a whole ton of sense. What um, else we got? There's going to be a Rom Space Night movie. What? Are you fucking shitting me? Wow. I mean, there was a com- Marvel comic that was huge <laughs> back in the day. The toy itself was a little boring. Um, yeah. I never ever, and I even asked for it as a child. Rom, the Space <laughs> Night. Uh, but the comic book series that came out of it, I remember, was, had a, a huge fandom. Uh, yeah. Who's doing it? Um, All Spark Pictures, which is Hasbro's movie producing arm. Okay. And it's being written by Zach Penn. Oh, he wrote, co-wrote uh, Ready Player One. He co-wrote Ready Player One and the first Avengers and X-Men 3 and created Alphas and he sold his first script at 23 years old, which was Last Amer- last Action Hero. That's right, man. That was, I remember he was one of the, uh, what do they call that? Spec script mm-hmm. kids. Made a lot of money for that, for that idea. Yeah. I met him once. He wrote The Hulk, right? Mm-hmm. I met him once at his uh, Battlestar Galactica panel. He was real nice. Uh, but yeah, and he's he's written some some really good shit. Yeah, now he's uh, he is one of those guys that Hollywood turns to when they want to do genre stuff. Right. He's in the midst of writing a film set in the Matrix world for Warner Brothers. Oh, uh, so a Matrix sequel that the mm. Wachowskis are not involved in. Right. Interesting. Uh, sequel, reboot, preboot, concurrent story, whatever that is. He's been very mum on it. Although he did say once in a quote, like if I was going to to cast, if I was going to recast Keanu Reeves, I'd cast Keanu Reeves. Uh. So it's not like they're trying to redo the Matrix. It's like, no, he's, that character will still exist as we know him. Oh, that's good. This is just another story in that world. In that world. Yeah. Um, remember we talked, I guess, last week about the Men in Black movie that yes. uh, Chris Hemsworth is starring in? Yes, very that, funny Chris Hemsworth. That I had pitched Tiffany Haddish to be his, uh, his shotgun writer in that? Smart fucking pull. I remember that. Uh, they, they didn't go that way. Um, they went with Tessa Thompson. Oh, that's Valkyrie. fucking great too. Yeah. Oh wow, so she's funny as well. She's it's a legit Ragnarok funny reunion. In that Thor movie, and I met her in real life, interviewing people for uh, IMDb up at Sundance, and she was real like witty and sharp. Yeah, she's a smart cat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is happening now. Um, I think again, they're not touching on J and K, although it's not a reboot. Like right. those characters will have existed in the world. These are just new agents for the Men in Black. I love it. I yeah. bet you they get a Will Smith cameo. At this point, why not? Uh, with a cast that cool, I'm sure he'll be like... I'm if he's on Instagram learning how to salsa dance with Mark Anthony, I'm sure he will show up <laughs> to get paid. Is that what he's up to? He's like living his best life at almost 50. Good for him, man. He had all that trouble in Philadelphia as a child. <laughs> <laughs> had to leave, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Under a cloud of sorts. Uh, what else we got? Um, Astro City is coming to television. Oh, that's a good fucking idea. Who's doing that? Uh, Fremantle Media right now. Is good idea. It. Kurt Busiek, right? Mm-hmm. Fuck, I love that series. That was good. Boy, that, you could do a whole anthology series. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the trick of that. Is yeah. that you know, it's tied together by the location, you know, and characters do sort of weave in and out and recur here and there, but finding what that show is, unless it's going to be like the Twilight Zone anthology set in the Twilight Zone and that's Astro City. Right. That's a, that's a tough nut to crack, but I'm so glad somebody's trying to crack it. I agree. Good source material. Like, you know, in a world where 
Yeah, I'm happy somebody's going to get a ROM movie, but that does not, <laughs> you know, fucking give me a chubby at all. But hearing this, I'm like, oh, shit, that could be interesting. Yeah. Um, so Gregory Novak, who used to be DC Films' guy before DC had an expanded universe. Okay. Like he was a producer on Red back when there was a Red and the oh, Losers yeah, yeah. way back when. That was a comic book movie. Yeah. Um, is executive producing and Buziek is writing, he's co-writing the pilot himself. Fucking A. Which is I'm, great. I'm on board for that. Yeah, man. No home for it. Just Fremantle's making it, and then they'll sell it. Yeah, they don't have a they don't have a network for They're it. They're the yet. cats that make the Neil Gaiman show, right? American Gods, That's right. right? So they have lots of money to spend on. They're things. in the comic book business. People are smart to be so. Not just like superheroes, but like there's some brilliant fucking books out there uh, that you know, great source material for ongoing series. I mean, think about it. They were ongoing series. Yeah, that's the nut. That's what it is. It's serial storytelling. Look, we've been doing it for seventy five years. Yeah, borrow some of this shit. Um, and the last story is not quite the nicest of stories, or at least it's, it's a little bit of a downer, but that's okay. Is this Me Too? No, it is oh. not Me Too. Well, Although, I, there was a trailer that broke for uh, this Mr. Rogers documentary <gasps> called, like, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Yes. And I saw that Mr. Rogers was trending, and I'm like, no, not Mr. Rogers. He didn't do anything bad. He can't. My childhood is innocent still. <laughs> I'm just dread every time I see somebody <laughs> trending. I'm like, not that guy. Please, not that guy. People are like, we've slowed down the recordings. And if you listen to him, if real close, he says, won't you fuck me, neighbor? <laughs> um, no, he was by all reports a fucking saint on earth. And that trailer uh, just makes you ashamed <laughs> to be a human being that's not as beauteous as, as the soul of fucking... Uh, uh, Fred Rogers. God damn it. What is the movie called? Uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor. When's it come out? Uh, summer. June, I think. I mean, that's a movie that could do... Le- it's a documentary, of course, but right. it could do legit business, especially like a time like now. It's nice to see somebody be so heroic by simply being kind and fucking caring and stuff. You watch that trailer, you can't help but tear up. Dude seemed like a seriously fucking decent individual. Yeah, there was this clip I saw online. I th- I'm sure it's not new, but it was... Fred Rogers testifying in front of a, a finance committee in the government mm-hmm. where they're about to shut down children's programs. PBS, like literally, yeah. you know, like QED in Pittsburgh or whatever. And he goes and he sits opposite, you know, the meanest, grumpiest, like cartoonishly cliched senator. He's like, I don't know what you're here about your children <laughs> stuff. They also, but- they also happen to be the panel of judges from Flashdance as well. <laughs> there was one guy blowing his nose and shit. And it was up to Fred Rogers to impress them all, <laughs> dump water on his body. <laughs> Sorry, I just rewatched Flashdance. Well, I mean, I don't need to say anymore. That's exactly what that was. <laughs> but the verbal equivalent, the emotional equivalent. The equi- emotional equivalent. And in the seven minutes of this clip, you see Fred Rogers just off the dome convince a senator to fund public television and children's programming because he's telling them why he why it's worth talking to children in this way why it's worth not just having cartoons and not just having what passes for educational entertainment again this was the 50s yeah it was him saying that you know treating children as emotional beings and understanding that they feel the same things that we feel without the tools that we have to navigate those feelings is important and what we're doing is we're arming children to navigate the world that they're going to live in and talking to them as people and treating them as people and, and not spending a fortune, but it's good work and it's worth doing so that when awful things in the world happen, they have the language to describe what they're feeling, that they have the ability to, to reckon with their own way in the world. How come nobody does that anymore? Uh, like, t- not commercial enough? Like, like I, when I think about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, I think about one of the most watched children's programmings of all time, programs of all time but not heavily merchandised. There wasn't a yeah. fuck ton of Mr. Rogers merchandise. He didn't seem interested in yeah. selling the show. He just wanted to have it exist. I mean, he, he could have made important. a mint on cardigans alone. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I've endorsed my own line of sweaters. But I mean, I think Sesame Street, you know, sort of also steered in that lane of, let's talk about divorce. Let's talk about death. Let's talk about True, war and conflict. they were also pretty commercialized. Like, they were. It was a wonderful show, but they were like, and you can buy an Oscar the Grouch and stuff right. like that. But, but I they think, didn't really do that with Mr. Rogers. Yeah, because I think his show was super cheap. Like, it was literally, I'm in, a, I'm in one tiny studio space, and I built this model of a town with my hands, and we have a puppet, and I wear a hat and a cardigan, 
and that's it. it. It's true. All the sets remain the same, I think, from the beginning. So yeah. like they amortize their costs in the first <laughs> week or something like that, and then just use the same set over yeah, and over. Yeah, they asked him, what does it cost to make your show? And it's like, well, it costs us about $2,000 a year. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's like, that's it. And everyone in the business was like, shut the fuck up, <laughs> Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> We got a scam going on. It costs a lot more than that. <laughs> Lucille Ball is on the phone. Like, I gotta keep myself in Cubans. No. <laughs> uh, but no, that just that clip is amazing, and the idea that there will be a documentary that kind of explores the world and the life of Fred Rogers, I cannot wait. That is not the story that I'm talking about. That is sad, though. Oh shit. Um, William Messner Loeb's. You remember that guy? Of course I do. He wrote. If you like the Flash TV show, you have to like and and owe a debt to uh, William Messner Loeb's. He worked on Flash uh, in the 80s and 90s, and a lot of the storylines and characters that they use on that show come from his stuff. When I first watched my very first episode of The Flash, the one that had the King Shark appearance, at the, like it was season two, episode one or two, and King Shark made his first appearance at, like at the tail end. Uh, and when I watched it at Jason Mewes' behest, like my first takeaway was, this plays exactly like a Bill Messner Loeb's mm. issue of Flash. Like, how charming, how wonderful and stuff. So, yeah, he was uh, writing when I was collecting and reading very ardently. Yeah, and he also he runs on Wonder Woman. He created Dr. Artemis yeah. for Wonder Woman, yeah. He is currently homeless on the streets of Detroit. I read that story. It's a bummer. And, and the idea, I mean, comics is, a, is an art form that I love. It's a medium that I love. But it has traditionally never been good to those who make it. Yeah. You know, for every, you know, Stan Lee, for, and I mean, Jack Kirby had to sue for rights back. I mean, Simon & Schuster absolutely had to, to go to war with DC and Warner Brothers to get their names back on the books. Not Simon & Schuster, Siegel. Siegel & Schuster. Simon & Schuster. Yeah, the book company. They're like, we're not rich. suing anybody. Um, you know, like there's, there is a long history of the people who built the worlds that we now enjoy and that we that other people profit heartily insanely from. off of yeah um do not get to share in any of that no. in fact they are now destitute in many ways and and the industry is coming around in the same way that the nfl used to just abandon players to the vagaries of time and guys with massive brain injuries and broken knees and powdered spines are just trying to you know get food um Comic says it's sure people. Spines is a fucking evocative term, man. Thank you. It's the name of my new band. Fantastic name for a band. Yeah. <laughs> we have been powdered spines. Um, but yeah, comics. Uh, for for as much as we love comics, sometimes comics does not love you back. How can we help Bill Messner Loeb's? I think that that it was a it was a new story that aired on on Fox in Detroit. And I think that in the wake of that story, people are beginning to rally and beginning to get him, you know, housing and beginning to get him aid, and hopefully putting him back to work, you know? I mean, yes. there's no reason why that dude can't still write. There's no reason why, that, I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing one-armed artist. You read this story, too, and he's like, he's had the life of fucking Job, man. Like, uh, the series of unfortunate events that leads to his homelessness is not like, oh, he was fucking wild, partied all, all his money away and shit like that. Not in, at the least. Uh, a lot of sickness there as well. And Bill has one arm, if I remember yeah. correctly. But, you know, there's no, like, pension for doing comics. No. It, is, it is like you either save your money or you just leave it up to the fates. There's one charity. What is Jim McLaughlin's charity? Uh, Hero Initiative? The Hero Initiative yeah. that Jim put together has been in existence, I think, at least maybe 10 years at the, this point, where that's, they raise money for the comic book creators mm -hmm. of old who have fallen on hard times. Right. So, I mean, it seems as if he's getting some help, and it seems as if he's not going to be living in a car on the streets of Detroit anymore. But, right. you know, just to be aware that, that for many of the people who built the foundations for our current, for our present, uh, it is not quite as rosy for them as it is for us. And it's also not as uncommon a story as you would imagine as well. Yeah. A lot of people who wrote your favorite shit, created your childhood memories, uh, don't walk away with the uh, financial wealth <laughs> that you walk away with the you know emotional wealth of reading those stories. Um, you know, where is this Detroit? Detroit, you know. And Marvel, to their credit, like they've absolutely started you know funneling money back, especially when characters are featured in movies, and they realize that okay, that if for no other reason than just PR, 
but it's also because there are decent people who run that stuff, mm. are beginning to feed money back into the pockets of the people who create those characters. But, you know, I don't know how much that is. I don't know how much it does. True. But, you know, if you find yourself in a place where the Hero Initiative is raising money, you know, throw a shekel in. Uh, maybe we could, uh, like, uh, auction, like, one of my Flash jerseys or something like that. Mm. Uh, raise a bunch of bucks as well. That'd be cool. Um, that's all the news is fit to print? That is all the news we have, my friend. That was a bummer story to go Yeah, on. that's okay. Um, we, got, we got a guest, though. Uh, we do. We do have a guest, man. So, last week, uh, we had a guest. This week, we have a guest on the show. Uh, we don't, uh, basically, I respond to passion. And, whoa. Ta-da! That kind of passion. The, like, <laughs> let's break the glass. We just got married kind of passion. <laughs> um, and and uh, um, the, this, our guest uh, reached out about being on the show because he's a fan of the show. But more importantly, he's a big Batman fan. Um, like, and you know, the show is called Fat Man on Batman, <laughs> and we so rarely talk about the Dark Knight anymore and stuff. Uh, so I felt like this, this is great. Let's bring this cat on. Uh, he is the lead singer in a band called the Black Veiled Brides. Is that correct? <laughs> and you're coming, you're gonna have to come this there. way. Oh, we're gonna leave him over there. Yay! Uh, give it up for, and, and is it? Beer sack? Beer sack. Give yeah. it up for Andy Beer Sack, ladies and gentlemen. We had a, a conversation in the alley beforehand. I'm going like it's B I E R sack. It's got to be yeah. like it's phonetically like it's beer the worst sack. possible way to pronounce it. <laughs> I went to Catholic school and they didn't want to pronounce it correctly, so they told me my name was Burzak growing up. They took your fucking beers the nuns away didn't from like you. It. Yeah, they hated the beer. You can understand like ball sack was real easy for like you know the bullies and everything, but right. beer sack that's the name. Oh my god, that's right. You got yeah. tagged ball sack probably. Yeah, so. I, I I feel like my wife said like in earnest when we got married that she wanted to take the name and then I was like don't do that though cause like my I name is no Beer choice. Sack like it's I love too you hard. don't go there she's like I love you and your sack I'm doing it Andy. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, alright so uh, where are you from sir I'm from Cincinnati Cincinnati in the uh, great state of Ohio and yeah. whatnot. Um, apparently as we said your name you heard a bunch of people go woo 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 uh, and you have a big social media following and stuff <laughs> Music shit seems to be working out pretty well. Yeah, so far. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I've been very fortunate. I'm in a rock band in 2018. It's a little bit like going into an Apple store and trying to sell somebody a record. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, it's an outmoded kind of antiquated why thing. Why explain but, that? Why? Why? Uh, I don't know, because rock is sort of seen as, like, the movie Rock of Ages, right? The punchline is the idea of rock music. Like, ha, remember rock. And that's sort of like the whole thing that we're fighting against as rock musicians is trying to to make people realize that the idea, the innate idea of like rebellion and everything else, like that's still built within. But for outcasts and losers and kids like me, rock is still the thing, you know? It's, it's, it means just as much to me as, I understand like hip hop and everything's really popular, but rock music to us is the thing that kind of turns us on. And now, there's still something irresistible about, you know, a power chord. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you can't quite get away from the magnetic quality of, look, whang, like that's kind of amazing. And you don't Absolutely. get that. Sorry. That's your power chord impression? Quang! <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I didn't like want to... a gong ringing, man. I didn't want to go like fuzz, because fuzz is weird on a microphone. Wouldn't it be more like... <laughs> Would that work? There's a British <laughs> magazine called Kerrang! And uh, it's, a really, it's been around for years and years, and I asked the editor one time why it's called that, and he said, because that's the noise a guitar makes. It isn't. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, You're like, I know where if I yeah. speak, it's my Have you job. ever Krang? It's not, it's the name of a Ninja Turtles villain, but it's That's not. Uh, <laughs> Excellent, Paul. What year were you born, sir? 1990. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Four years before we made Clerks, okay. Um, uh, so what your childhood uh, 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 heroes, I understand, I read someplace, uh, you, saw Kiss. Yeah. You saw Kiss in a Batman mask or Gene Simmons? Well, in a no, so mask? I was, my introduction to rock music came from Batman, essentially. So I, I was introduced to Batman by my dad when I was really young, the Adam West TV series. He had bootleg VHSs I watched when I was a kid. Nice. And when I saw the old Kiss 70s trading cards, I saw Gene Simmons, which is essentially a Batman logo on his face, and I thought, oh, those are superheroes of some kind. And so that was kind of my introduction to, to rock music, was assuming that Kiss was superheroes. 
Um, which you weren't all that wrong. They did the Marvel comic at one point. Absolutely. For a minute, they were yeah. superheroes. And Kiss Meets the Fam of the Park, they were total fucking superheroes. <laughs> there could be worse things for like a little kid who loves the idea of like costumery and pageantry than like this band I like has comic books and movies about them. It was like, I don't know. For me, uh, everything does come back to Batman though. Like that was my, my main thing. So who's your Batman? So, so how weird, like you built this whole career and at the center of it that's not even about batman but at the center of it you're like yeah man batman's what kind of made me want to yeah sing like i that's mean, i was i was a like like many people that end up in rock bands i was a kind of uh loner you know nerd i i, I didn't do well in school i wasn't very popular but i thought of myself as like this i could create this version of myself that is all the things that i'm afraid of and presented on stage as like the rock star guy. And that was the biggest inspiration for me with all of comic books was these kind of characters that, particularly the ones that didn't have superpowers, that took uh, elements of their fears and anxieties and things that they wanted to be and turned themselves into that. So that was like the coolest thing for me. And I think I realized as I got older that one of the reasons why I liked Batman so much was that kind of level of, you know, it, it's, it's a guy who, well, yes, he's a billionaire and in a much better situation than yeah. most of us, uh, it's a person turning their fears on, on their head and making themselves into it. I mean, Batman is nothing if not theatrical. Like, yeah. that's built into the DNA of who Batman is. I mean, he's born in the back of a theater. Ultimately. And he's kind of a loser as a person. Like, he doesn't know how to talk to other people, really, and he, he sucks with relationships. I mean, his fucking and, parents were yeah. killed right in front of him. Yeah. I just mean, he's like... He's a loser. He yeah. lost his parents. Yeah. The trauma, yeah, understandably so, but I just mean in the sense that, is, I don't know, I, just, I felt an association with him in that way. Yeah. Um, Tim Burton was the same way, man, right? Like, yeah. his whole take on Batman was like, he's the ultimate outsider. Um, you talked about, like, building the onstage persona... Gerard Way talked about the same thing. Yeah. Like, he was a comic book kid as well, worked in a comic book store. And then when My Chemical Romance happened, he was like, I get to build a character and go up and be the character of, like, a rock star. Yeah. You know, but, uh, like, when I'm done, I go home, read my comics and stuff like that. As that seems to be a part of rock and roll more than anything else is there's still showman. It's about a show. You're putting on a show. It's not as simple as we're going to get up here and fucking sing. Yeah, There is some absolutely. theatricality to it. Yeah, I think... I think one of the things, like for, for my band, anybody that if at some points you go, who the hell was that Tim Burton character standing there? <laughs> and you look me up, uh, it, you'll see a lot of lipstick and makeup and the whole thing. And a lot of that is just the idea of creating that kind of like, that's your costume. That's your, that's your armor that you're going on stage with. And it's putting on a show. You know, I think that one of the reasons why, when I look at like the hip hop culture, one of the reasons why I love current hip hop so much is that there is art and there's a culture to it and there's intrigue and there's fashion and all this it's just that the music for me isn't what i grew up loving as much right. um i want and i would hope that rock stars and stuff you know i mean gerard's a great example of a person who's so multifaceted and is intelligent and presented so much and is a great comic book writer and uh i just you know for me that's that's kind of the reason why i got into rock music is is obviously the pageantry of it but also just the the kind of escapism, you know? Life now, is so has so many drudgeries. The idea of like writing a hard rock record and, and singing along to something loud in your car, like, it's fun. Um, so you're about 12 years old. How old yes. are you? <laughs> 15, <laughs> no, so, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm 27. 27. 27, so when did you start music and when did you feel like, ah, like we're at a place? You know, you, some people like you ask, hey, when did you feel like you made it? And they're like, I'm still waiting, but when did you get to a place where you're like, I'm fucking safe. I could be me. I don't have to do another job. I don't have to work for some other asshole. This is who I can be for a living and stuff. Yeah, How long between when the dream begins, the journey begins, and that moment happens? I or mean, has that moment not yeah, happened? There, it's a multifaceted there's, question. There's substantial things of like where you, I have a house, you know, that kind of thing. So you go like, oh, now, you know, I'm not, I'm not living month to month. Um, but for me, like I dropped out of high school. I, I moved out here from Ohio with nothing. I lived in the back of my car, 86 Cadillac Eldorado, just trying to make it. So for me, it was, I had no other options. I kind of threw everything else away and said, I have to do this. But so, what does one do in that instance? Like if you're an actor, you come out and you're auditioning and shit. What are you doing as just playing gigs, trying I, to play gigs? Yeah, I lived in my car uh, at a rehearsal studio space. And I don't know if you, do you remember the band Wasp from the 80s? What was it called? Uh, Wasp. Wasp? Wasp? Fuck yeah. Yeah, so 
Uh, the guitar player in that band is a guy named Chris Holmes. Nobody's mentioned Wasp to me in like a decade. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. I just got warm memories. I'm like, yeah. fuck yeah, I remember Wasp. Blackie so, Lawless, uh, right? Well, yeah. So the guitar player in that band was he's uh, most notably in the decline of Western civilization. He's floating in a pool, spitting vodka or uh, at himself. Uh, I lived in a rehearsal space parking lot. It was a lockout because you could park there 24 hours. And it turns out that so did he. So my first, my first friend and the person that I met, he, he had a space where he was building guitars out of trees and shit. And he'd come over and bring me bags of ice just randomly like, hey, fucking Alice Cooper kid. And he'd bring me a bag of ice. <laughs> and we became friendly that way. And so I started to meet other people at the rehearsal space, people that also had long black hair and wore eyeliner like me. And it kind of like started jamming and then it was just about playing as often as possible. We couldn't get shows here at first. Like we couldn't get shows at the whiskey and all those places that people want to play. Why is it super competitive? Yeah, because it's all pay to play. Like you have to be able to sell X amount of tickets to play at those places. So we didn't have any fans or friends. So right. <laughs> it was hard to sell tickets. Uh, so we would play like skate shops, parking lot of skate shops and stuff. And uh, yeah, it, it, we were able to work our way up that way. So wait, when you came out here, you didn't have a band yet? I had, I had, well, kind of. I, so in Northern Kentucky, like Cincinnati area, I had started a variation of the band, and I told everybody, when I turn 18, I move in L.A., we're all going to go, and we would all, yeah, we're all going to go to L.A.T., and then the day came and nobody came with me, so I came out here by myself. <laughs> and, uh, you don't want to live in a car? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. Yeah, I had to start over again. Yeah. So when you came here, that's when you found the people who would be in Black Veil Brides with yes. you? Yes, yeah. At, because of the Wasp guy? No, it was just that was the first person that I had met and but I was able to make shows. connections through, you know, meeting him meant, okay, well, now there's another guitar player who's there who would maybe take this, essentially, this 18-year-old kid seriously living in his car. Oh, well, you know that person and uh, kind of connecting that way. But I, I met everyone uh, kind of in a very organic way where I met a guitar player and then he introduced me to a bass player and he introduced me to a drummer and then we would start touring and touring in cars. All like-minded individuals, like I like that music too. Yeah, I mean, being in a band's weird, right? Because like the Very only, the, there's no, you don't know anything about the people that you're in a band with. You go, I like Black Sabbath, you like Black Sabbath. That's the whole basis. And then you're on tour and you're in Idaho together and you're like, holy shit, you hate cats a lot? Like whatever weird <laughs> random <laughs> thing that you find out about somebody. <laughs> Ultimately, you, you kind of, it's like a really weird arranged marriage, but... Fortunately, I'm happy that the four people I've been in a band with for the last 10 years have, have, uh, are nice friends of mine. Is that what happened to the Beatles? John found out Paul hated cats? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's how every major band is in. Uh, all right, wait. Preference. So you come to Hollywood at 18 and now you're 27. How long has the band been like popping? Like, uh, how many years? In terms of doing well or, I mean, maybe in the last, uh, I mean, it, it, it took off. Probably around 2010, 2011 was when things started going really well. So how old were you? So that's, so, all right, let's do reverse math. Seven yeah, years ago. Seven, yeah. 20 so you years came old. out in, when you were 18. Yeah. And you're 27. I dropped nine years ago. Like you only had to try for two fucking years. <laughs> no, 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 no. So I thought uh, this was a story about paying dues. I had. I, well, yeah, I mean, honestly, thankfully, it, it did take off when I was here, but I had toured, I had started touring when I was 16 regionally all through. Oh, the, shit, you were West, one of those so, people. Yeah, so I was with older guys in vans, just none of them came with me here, so I had to restart, but I already had a name and people that were kind of fans-ish, and thankfully, at that point, we had things like MySpace where you could put songs up, and there were people who were interested in that. So, so you used social helpful. media to build it up and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you still do solo stuff in, in addition to Black Veil Brides? Yeah, yeah, I, I was I, I was very interested in doing, like, uh, I guess kind of Depeche Mode, Bauhaus, like kind of goth music, and oh, fuck. I, I thought, I didn't want to be the guy who's like, now, hey, we're like a glam heavy metal band, but check out the goth records. So I wanted to kind of, <laughs> you know, I wanted to do something separate, and, and thankfully I was able to do that, and then people responded to it. Um, all right, so that's the career, and the career is predicated on uh, talent, of course, and a willingness, apparently, to fucking go out here, believe in yourself. Fuck, that's a story about, like, really believing. But you knew you had the, here, let me ask you this. Like, when people go like, oh my God, did you know? It would happen. You did know, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Not in a way of like arrogant, like fuck. Of course, it's gonna happen because I'm talented. But what were your options? Like, you literally left home behind to fucking live in a car in Los Angeles. Clearly, you were single-minded with purpose. But people don't do that, like, unless they feel like they can see the future, like they knew it was fucking happening. Did you know that was gonna happen? Like, I watched a tape I made that I gave to my parents before I went to film school. <laughs> and I was like 20, I just played it on Smodcast. It's fucking hysterical, because I'm so earnest and shit. So serious, and you're like, this guy made clerks? But in any event, 
Yeah. I'm telling them exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm kind of right in about 98% of the way. I say that I'm never probably going to live with them again. That wasn't true. I wound up moving back home <laughs> one more time. But other than that, like I kind of called it. And it's weird when I listen to it now because I'm like, and I watch the tape, I'm like, oh, my God, like this kid had an idea. And right. I don't know if it was just like he was foolish enough to be leave. Like this will work out. Things always work out. Or if he actually believed it like i owe a yeah. lot to that goofy fucking kid who believed in himself when like i from where i stand looking back i'm like why did he believe in himself and sure yeah. <laughs> but yeah. did you know that it was gonna happen yeah i mean i think i think that there's a certain level of like insufferable that you have to, like i'm an only child and i had no friends so i was just basically oh my god that's the perfect yeah, fucking i was laugh, forcing my parents star, like man. all the time like I, I would have them take the camcorder and, and I would make them read interviews that I had written for myself that I had answers for that I, <laughs> so, about oh, my future as a big rock star. Like, you know, my mom would, and Andy, um, so now that you're the biggest rock star in the world, well, thank you very much, mom, I am. Uh, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I guess in that way, I, I, I just really wanted it. You know, I wanted to be that guy on the stage. I wanted to, to, to get to do this. So the only way I knew how to do it, being from Ohio, was just to come out here and try. Fuck, that worked. Um, all right, so Batman. I saw a picture of you online for a birthday yeah. dressed up in Batman regalia. It was yeah. a young birthday, correct? Yeah. How old? I, well, I was Batman every year, so I mean, up until <laughs> the last year that I was Batman was 2012, and it ended really badly. I wore a, uh, a Adam West bat suit, and uh, I can't smoke weed um, at you all. Poor son of a so, bitch. So yeah, all right. It's not. It's not a. Ju it's not a judgmental thing. I have a physical reaction. Right. And so we all but, do. We get high. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, I get. I, I vomit. And uh, oh, it's that's not, not the yeah, good not high. Not good. Yeah. So, I, but. Many times in my life, I've been faced with a situation where I, particularly when I was younger, I would say, but surely that's not true. I can definitely smoke weed. It's all in your mind. Right. And then I would vomit. Um, <laughs> and so it was Halloween 2012. I'm wearing the bat suit. And again, one of those opportunities came up where someone said, hey, Andy, would you like to smoke some weed? And I said, yes, I would. And then I smoked weed and then I vomited all on the inside of the bat suit, filled it. It was a lycra bat suit. I filled it with oh, uh, vomit. Wait, well, did you pull it out and puke into your yeah, fucking suit? And, yeah. yeah. Well, because I had the mask, I went burr, and it just kind of like down the neck. Oh my God. I was in the middle of a street on, in downtown and my wife was dressed as the Julie Newmar Catwoman and she had to drag me back to, we lived downtown at the time, our home, and dress as Catwoman with heels and vomit the she, the toilet broke and all the vomit came up on her so she had like a shitty vomity bats or cat suit on and at that uh, point you're like oh I don't like so Batman I've never dressed anymore. it yeah that was my last Halloween that was the last one that I dressed up as Batman uh, the moral of the puffing. story that I hear out of that whole story is you gotta try weed again yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're being too judgy on it or next year just go as a bag of vomit and just cut out the middleman yeah, yeah exactly um, holy shit, how charming. All right, so Batman been a big part of your life. If you were born in 90, who's your first Batman? What's your first Batman? In comics, my yeah. first Batman was Jean-Paul Valley. Oh my God, <laughs> Nightfall wow. Batman with yeah. the fucking robot suit and shit that like that. That was my first, like, my dad buying me comics, bringing it home. I have a tattoo on my arm of Azrael Batman. I have a big ass, yeah. It's under it. Let's see. Uh, it's not good. Take it off, take it off. <laughs> when did you get it? What year? I don't, well, it's right there. Holy it fuck, man. You got know it. I, mean? I got it. Even I the like creator 16. of Jean Paul Valley doesn't have him tattooed on I, his Just body. me. <laughs> just me. That's and then my incredible. dad has old school, like regular, like Neil Adams Batman. There. On his arm? Yeah, yeah, in the same place. Did you guys go together? Yeah, yeah. I was like 16 when I got it. I'm just going to take this off. Are you shitting me? So you, you were like, Dad, I want a tattoo of Batman. And he's like, well, only if I get one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad actually has... Uh, hold on. I'm going to put this back on. My dad such actually, a rock star. That was, man. It was such a rock star movie. You literally put the mic in a like mic hole of some <laughs> sort. And then we're able to put it back. As uh, my so dad has a full sleeve of Batman tattoos, as do I. He's, a, he's the one who introduced me to it. So my dad 
was in bands and stuff when I was a kid and, and he traveled a little bit and when he would come back he would bring me comic books right. and so that was my real my first Batman comic was the one that was introducing Osriel where it was the fold cover where it had him you know regular Batman then oh new Batman the Joe Quesada cover right yeah so that uh, that was my first introduction to the character and I didn't really like that version of the character because I'm not a pacifist but my interest in Batman was more about like the angst and the brood and not like the you know the daggers in people's eyes and you know yes. all that kind of stuff and he was I'm fighting the urge to be an assassin and shit yeah like yeah it was a little confusing for me as like a five year old uh you know it's the true. order like, of Saint Dumas and all that I was like I have no idea what this like, is what does this have to do with Batman particularly like when you everything. consider that I'm watching like Val Kilmer and then I look down at my comics and I'm like this doesn't compute at all <laughs> it's true but god that was a good story so were you like when night fall and it became like, what was it? Nightfall, Night Quest. And Night's End. And then Night's End. So were you happy when fucking Bruce Wayne came back? Yeah. Or were you baffled? Like, who is this old man? Yeah, no, I was into it. I didn't love, like, the the weird anatomically correct bat suit that he wore to, like, with the face to come back where he was. Yeah. That was weird. Uh, but everything, I mean, I, I enjoyed the whole story. I've always loved Dick Grayson. Like, I loved his, his part in that, him becoming Batman shortly. And... Um, I don't know. For me, like that's my nostalgia book. I, I go back to him all the time. When you first got that book, did you go backwards to be like, who is Azrael, and buy like sort of Azrael, the miniseries and shit? Were they interested? A little him? bit. I mean, I was a kid, so I was I was more just in the moment, like you know, getting it every week and, and seeing what was happening next, and all the shadow of the bat and all the different storylines that were going on. Do you remember the Jean Paul Valley Batman? Vaguely. I remember with not liking it. Very robotic suit, no skin on the face, like a full face mask and stuff. I just it wasn't my Batman. So I'm like, what is this bullshit? Um, it, <laughs> well, but they did like a, a gradient into it, which I find funny because they Damn. started where he had the bat suit, and yeah, but he wore the claws, and then he slowly went like slowly full the outfit robot becomes over the armor. Time. Which actually, to be fair, is like you know I never saw it as like this is stupid. I'm like, why wouldn't you wear yeah. fucking body armor? Impervious. And yeah. yeah. Um, ben Affleck certainly did. <laughs> I saw him talking on some clip online. Uh, I guess it was during the Justice League junket. And he was, he said, because I remember watching that movie, one thing stuck out to me was how he, when he's wearing the final suit in the third act, like yeah. he, he looks like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Like he bit. can't put his arms <laughs> yeah. down. It's just yeah. like this. Oh, he also vomited in his suit. <laughs> <laughs> like, he tried weed at the end of Justice League. Um, but he, uh, he said in the interview that like they keep adding things to the suit and the biggest like challenge in being Batman is to just hold your arms naturally because it looks like that with Yeah, it really yeah. I felt bad for him after I saw that cuz I thought that was him just being a jock I and being like, that, that he's always like this the whole movie. Yeah, he just can't put his hands together. Like if you fought this Batman in the real world, you would totally win cuz yeah. he's just like can't. <laughs> well, the thing they keep adding to the suit is meatball sandwiches. It's not like <laughs> it's like Ben is adding to his belly. Do you think so? It didn't look that svelte. He didn't. He never took his shirt off in Justice League the way he did in Batman v Superman. I don't know if two heavy guys are allowed to judge a thin person like that. <laughs> well, I haven't I, taken I my shirt off saying. since childhood, man. Listen, so I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so Batman. Uh, is your thing and, and, and was uh, since childhood. Where else do you go with it in the world of Batman? Uh, what do you mean? Like in comic books or just in Fandom, general? wherever. Take us on yeah, a Batman I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I was, I guess as a kid, I was, I was heavily into just kind of the DC world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, it's not any like slight against Marvel, but when I was a kid, that was just the thing I gravitated towards was the more kind of totally. really monolith you know, the kind of the mythology behind it. all the Alex Ross paintings when I was a kid had a big effect on me and mm. seeing that kind of like, oh, these are Like gods. a realistic representation of like, yeah. these fuckers could be real. Yeah. And, and he and was always like, he would be the guy that would make a Superman suit and have his friend wear it so that he had a life model right there. It was yeah. not guesswork. He found real people to wear those suits. So fucking brilliant. And I love that art. Like, I loved Kingdom Come for that reason, being able to see all of his art. And then obviously when he started doing more books. But uh, that was, he will always be my favorite artist just because I loved that representation of the characters. Um, the, uh, when you go out in the world and do press, like when you're doing your day job, it gets to speak for itself. But do you, I would imagine you have to go out and fucking do interviews and shit like that. Do you talk about comic book fandom? You talk about like, oh my God, I love this character, blah, blah, blah. Or do you mostly talk about 
the music. I don't know how it goes in that. World. I mean, it, it really depends. I, I'm very open about my my interest in comics and, and particularly Batman. Obviously, I mean, I have a lot of Batman tattoos. And, you know, it's kind of a dead giveaway. So people do ask me about it a lot. It's always like when you do like a jokey interview, right? Like, so what's your favorite? Blah blah blah. And then that's always some sort of Batman related thing. But uh, I do talk about it a lot. You know, I, I try I try to because to me. All right, so I went to Batman versus Superman, and I was, and I'm standing, or I'm sitting next to a little kid who's got his action figures, and he's waiting to see Batman and the joy of seeing Batman, and then he watched that movie, and I thought, that's not. And then not... he threw up in his <laughs> Batman suit. <laughs> it's not, and it's not a, a criticism of the movie entirely. It's just the entire lack of joy that's in that movie, and how I, it, I don't want, particularly for like we have younger fans the character represents so much and brings so much joy and hope and, and is so interesting to me that I, if I, as a guy who sings in a rock band who wears a bunch of makeup, whatever else, like if I can say, hey, go read this comic book or, or look into the character in this way and don't just look at it as like jock MMA fighter guy who is mad about everything, like that's just not, that's not the character to me. It just feels- Oh my feels... God, that's kind of what it was, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> he was dragging that tire and he was super yeah. pissed. It doesn't feel like it represents me at all for why I love the character because it doesn't feel like an outsider. It feels like the bully, you know. Oh, such a great point. It, it was weird because it sure looked the most like the character Absolutely. we've ever yeah. seen in the movie. But I don't know if we wanted that. I thought I did. Yeah. And then I saw it and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted the gray suit so much and I'm like, oh, it's just pajamas now. Like That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. They took off the fucking short shorts. You know, at the end of the day, I think those movies are flawed, but I think uh, they are pretty fascinating. It's one person's tonal take on material that I was very familiar with laid out over and over again in the same way. And this person, whether like, because that's how they read these books or whether they're like, oh, I want to put my spin on it, took those characters in completely different directions than I'd ever seen before. And, yeah. and it's not always bad, it's, it's just different and stuff. But that being said, I've, I hear what you're saying. It's tough to show a kid, I would imagine, I haven't had to do that, but you know, an eight year old Batman v Superman and be like, don't worry, they'll stop talking soon. You know? yeah, and like, exactly. And I swear, they're both heroes, even though yeah. they fucking hate each other and yeah. stuff. And I swear, they're both there, you just can't see because it's real dark on the screen. <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. For me, um, the best part of those movies is that there will be something for another filmmaker to react to. Yeah. yeah. So that the next iteration of these things will be polar opposite of what we got that time. I think we saw movement already with Justice League. You know, the elements that are in there, at least at least there's fun in it. I mean, I think what we all had, at least if I, from my perspective of like the, the, the fandom of that character, we really wanted what we got in the Nolan movies. And then we all went like, oh, all the other superheroes are having fun now and our guy's just really serious and real. And I think everybody was excited to see maybe a little bit of the fantasy get put in right. um, to the Batman world. And I just think Batman versus Superman wasn't fantastic enough. Whereas Justice League, like I can deal with the one-liners and everything else. And I know Batman doesn't make any sense in that context, but that's kind of the joy of like, he really doesn't want to be here. And that's always been kind of a fun part of him being in the Justice League. But uh, I think even going, I, obviously the, you're, it's a slippery slope, right? Because then you're heading towards Schumacher world. So like, I don't. Yeah, it's like, hey man, be happy yeah. with the Batman. <laughs> it's you like, got. I don't know. Maybe we're just forever going to do this. We're going to get gritty and then too gritty. And then we're going to get really bright. And then over and over again forever. For me, it's like, it, look, as many times they want to hand out that character. Like in comics, he's been written by a bunch of people, not just one person and stuff. You know, some people are going to have takes where you're like, oh my God, I fucking like, just like, I've read a lot of Justice League uh, comic books over the course of my life. My favorite Justice League comics were written by Grant Morrison. Don't mean I don't like the other ones, but when I fucking think about, oh, the Justice League, how good it could be, it was in the hands of that creator. So in the case of like Batman with Nolan, clearly that character clicked insanely well uh, with that creator. In the case of Zack Snyder, sometimes it clicked well. Visually, you can't fucking beat it. it fuck, that shit looks like an Alex, Ro Alex Ross painting most yeah. of the time. Tonally, though, it was off in, in some places and stuff. So I look forward to the next iteration. It look, looks, looks like it's Matt Reeves, and we'll get a Batman again. But they don't seem to be racing toward it, man. Like, and I'm, I, you know they're going to because that's where the money is. But I, I guess it's more important to keep Wonder Woman going now that the, the pump has been primed. It made a mm. bunch of money, and everyone's like, we like that, more of that, and shit like that. I mean, take a beat, take a pause, reset, put your house in order, and then get back to work. Make the new gods instead. Bless you. Um, all right, so um, 
for those here in the room and for those listening at home. Yeah. Uh, fuck, you got an inspiring story already. And as much as like you had a vision, you did it. Now you're a fucking rock star. Holy fuck. How do you get there? How does that work for people who are like, I'd like to do that. Maybe not the exact same thing, but fuck, I want to be the person I wanted to be at age 16. Like that's fucking rarefied air you're breathing, man. A lot of us, you know, if I, want, if I was who I wanted to be at age 16, I'd be a serial masturbator. But, um, <laughs> but a lot of us don't have a fucking dream that like we could carry through sure. into adulthood. Mine oh, you still could if you want. That's true. I mean, that's there for you. <laughs> I'll get there, <laughs> God damn it. But uh, I'm building toward it. But like, um, not everyone gets to do that. That's breathing rarefied air. For those who are interested in that sort of thing, who are like, I want to be like my, not my 16 year old self, but I want to do the thing that made me passionate at this age for the rest of my fucking life. How do they get there? Because you fucking did it, it. Well, it sounds cliche, but I think the biggest thing, and you know this, is, is work. I mean, yeah. it's, honestly, it's, there is, there's a stigma attached to doing too much and people get like worried about getting exhausted when it comes to this. And I think in this town, especially people are like, oh, I'm so overworked. But the reality is until you get to the point where you can sit back, you have to be willing to do everything that's put in front of you. And that makes you kind of uncomfortable for a while. But for me, um, I wanted to do something that is essentially a non-job that allows for me to prance around in tight pants and eye makeup <laughs> for a living. So I was going to do... you take do... your shirt off in these proceedings Sometimes, as well? Sometimes, yeah. Or are you one you of know, those naked yeah. boys that yeah, takes their yeah, shirt off on yeah. stage? If you, get to the, yeah, if you get to the point where that you're allowed to do that at work, why not? You know? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. I mean, you're saying that to us life. right here? <laughs> like, <laughs> I love this job, but I'll never get to the point where I'm like, mother... <laughs> <laughs> Hey! However, it's true. Perhaps <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. If people were making it rain, it would be easier because I like cash more than anything. However, else. it is acceptable in the context of what you're doing. If you did do that, people might go, "What the hell?" But in your you world, fuck, could it's do expected. it. You could do yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, that's dope. But yeah, man. I mean, I think it's just honestly more than anything, and it's cliche as hell. But just working hard and and understanding that complacency is the enemy and, and doing something new every day to try to achieve your goal and to try to be as, as, as well read on the subject of what you're trying to do as possible. A lot of people, times people don't read and there are so many books out there on, on every industry and there's so much opportunity to become educated on a topic. I just think that the celebration of ignorance is, is sometimes it gets in people's way. Holy fuck. I'm just going to uh, pass out a compliment real quick. Uh, and this is going to sound parental and shit, but I am older than you, so it works. Um, <laughs> the, you are incredibly well healed. You are a credit to your parents. That's something that I remember in my childhood. Thank you. Like I'd hear that and be like, what does that mean? But as a, a, an adult with a parent and shit, whenever I meet somebody now in their like a 15 to like 25 year old range and you're pretty damn close like that's the thing that i'm always like taken aback by where i'm like fuck man like somebody raised you right and shit. what did mom much. and dad do uh my dad is a labor relations officer for the county in hamilton county in cincinnati and my mom works at the children's hospital there and they're oh, my best friend noble so, work yeah. man did you say they're your best friends always have been i talk to them almost every day yeah. i'm gonna fucking yeah. cry yeah. um <laughs> They have clearly they've gone to shows throughout your fucking life. And always, stuff. yeah. Um, if Almost to possibly to a fault. My dad is always there, <laughs> very present, <laughs> very loud. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. You're like, uh, I can't get the rock star life on because fucking dad's right yeah. there. My dad has a tattoo of me. <laughs> uh, I gotta so, say, that's that's being a great parent. Man. Absolutely. Like some people carry around a picture, but you're like, fuck it, put it right there. Yeah, man. yeah. That's what I mean, though. Like I. I I just I have a really good connection with them both and they mean a lot to me and uh, my wife has the same situation with her parents so it's it's been I've been really lucky in that way where did you meet your lady and how long you guys been married uh, we've been together for just about uh, almost seven years and we've been married for coming up on two in about 16 days so uh, okay, yeah, hey, we're man. Excited about that. Mazel um, Mazel top but we met we met on tour uh, and she was uh, playing uh, on a, I was on a festival tour and she was playing on an acoustic stage and I happened to see her and I told our security that I wanted to just go stand there and be creepy every day until she noticed me. That was the plan. <laughs> and then she came and watched us play the next day so I didn't have to do that. But the plan was just to stand <laughs> like that. <laughs> and wait, because I figured if I was weird, she would at the very least, what the hell is this guy doing? And then maybe security. strike up a conversation. Yeah. Every great romance is really the most uncomfortable stalking story ever if you play the right music on <laughs> yeah. it. 
Well, yeah. that it also begins too with you seeing somebody, not even knowing what they're like and stuff, and being like, "Oh yes, she will be mine." Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it goes even further because I had heard her music and I thought her poetry and lyrics, so I was like, "We're going to be friends. I know what she's all about." Oh, you like, connected <laughs> with her material and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you write your own material. Yes. And have been since yes. the beginning. I mean, I collaborate with the band and, and other people that I've worked with. How does that fucking work for somebody that doesn't do music? Like, I, I always used to have this conversation with Alanis Morissette back in the day, because she was like the first musician like that I knew that I could ask stupid questions to. And I was like, how do you write a song? She's like, oh, you know, you just come up with it and you write it. I was like, yeah, but what do you, do you write the lyrics first and then you figure out what it's gonna sound like? Or do you write the music first and then you come up with lyrics later on? She goes, it's kind of both at the same time. It's hard to explain, but yeah. it's just happening simultaneously. It, how it, does it work? Yeah, I mean, some, I have had songs where it started with a lyric or an idea, but by and large, because of the hard rock like thing, it's a lot of guitar parts, and it's very hard to dictate what a lead part is going to be in a song unless you're doing it kind of in conjunction with each other. So um, most of our songs are written where there is a guitar part, and then I build a melody, or we build the structure of the song that way, and then the lyric is written over top of everything else. But at least, usually I start with a title before anything else. Really? It begins yeah. with you going like, fucking, I'm going to call it this. Yeah, because I like, I like to, to think this. conceptually, like there's, this is what the song's going to be about. Like we wrote, um, our, our third record that we did, which was our first major label record, we did like a full movie adaptation and treatment for it. So it's a concept record, so there's a whole story. There were characters, we had the character design of everything. Like we did, a, and, then, and that way all the songs had to fit beats to get the story moving in the context of the record. So like with that, titles were really important. That being said, like, you could probably write a comic book. I hope so. You know, I've, I've been fortunate to work with, you mentioned Gerard uh, Way, and, and I've become friendly with him, and I worked with him on the and last And he's running a whole yeah. fucking label over yeah. at DC. And, I, and I've spoken to him just about my interest in that before, and he was really encouraging. So that's something I'd love to do. I mean, yes, yeah, so if you can write in one medium, you can write in the other. Particularly if you responded to the poetry of the soul of the woman you eventually married just by watching an acoustic set. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That sounds more like you were like, she was just really cute. <laughs> and it grew from there. Wow, fucking. Um, all right, so you were married when you became a rock star? The band, yeah, the band took off as uh, we were in a serious relationship. I got married kind of right before the solo record came out. But yeah, yeah we've, I've been, since the success of the band, I have been with, with my, my same partner. Um, are you a superstitious person? Because now you've got to stay forever, man. She's the reason <laughs> yeah, you're successful. She's the reason, yeah, yeah. Well, she's like hooked up to a bunch of tubes. Like I suck all of her power out at night, and that's how, that's how you know I, I get to do all this. She's written every lyric. I just take it away from her, and then I steal and claim all of it. Shit, she says. You just write down. You're like, keep yeah. talking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, when is the next album come out or drop, as they say? Uh, so we we just put out a record literally a couple weeks ago. It's called Veil. Vale. Uh, it is. Uh, yeah. And it's, uh, it's available everywhere you can buy music. It's a Black Veil Brides record. And then I'm, I'm finishing up my new solo record right now, which will come out at the beginning of next year. And the next thing is I'm, I'm putting out a book in the next couple of months. What's uh, the book? So I worked on it uh, with a friend of mine named Ryan Downey, uh, who is sitting over there. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Uh, yeah, so he, uh, he's been interviewing me for years for, through different mediums. And so we, I, the idea was I wanted to write about kind of what I'm talking to you uh, about tonight, my story and, and the story of someone who is, it's not a memoir because I'm too young for that, but the idea of like how this happened and how you could possibly do it too, you know? Nice. Um, and so he had been interviewing me for years and so we had all this collection of interviews from the time I was 16 and, and worse at speaking than I am now and right. to now and kind when of When you taking, weren't a credit to your parents. Yeah, and yeah, shit. and taking, and I also, I've been sober for about a year and a half. I was a very heavy drinker for quite a while. Oh, right on, good um, for you. Um, and so, ignore all this. Yeah. <laughs> Being able to talk about kind of my journey through that and, and taking all these interviews of like some of which I was very drunk for and rereading and taking little pieces and bits out of it and kind of building the story for the last couple of years through stuff that I've written and said, stuff that I've told him, interviews that we've done, kind of the whole thing. Beautiful, man. When will it be done? When is it out? Well, it was supposed to be out this week, but it is not. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had, we, had to, we had to change some things. So, but uh, it's going to be coming out soon. That's well, all. Good night, man. What's beautiful about somebody that uh, makes uh, their success is if they even have a remote thought about reaching back to like tell others, hey, this is how you fucking do it, man. Uh, your heart's in the right fucking place. So, uh, you know, in this business, uh, some people get successful and we sit around going like, they don't deserve it, they're fucking shit heels or whatever. That has nothing to do with it. It has something to do with if you have something to sell. That being said, 
Holy fuck. It's nice that something nice happened to a nice fucking kid. Thank Look you. at you, Thank man. You Give it up for Andy, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job, sir. Right. Okay. Pleasure. Pleasure. Fantastic. So fucking thin. <laughs> Um, all right, man. That was fucking my fascinating. best day. I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, the, I mean, he, you literally stuck the microphone in your pants, and those pants were tight, and there was still room for a microphone. <laughs> Rock and roll. Okay, we've come to that part of the show, ladies and gentlemen, where uh, we turn to you, the audience, to provide the rest of the contest, uh, context. Uh, contents. Fuck. Uh, as always, we're going to do Q&A now. We got 10 tickets. Five sets of two, as always, from our good friend, uh, Brett Deacon, and the folks at the 40X Theater, where you can go see a movie. If you've never seen a movie in 40X, oh my God, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, it smells like it smells like in the movie. There's, uh, the, the seats move around and shit. It's like a thrill ride, but you're watching a movie at the same time. Good times. Uh, we uh, thank the folks at 40X. They're always giving us these movie vouchers. We give them out to you. If you ask a question, and that question is uh, quote-unquote worthy, uh, it's got to be something that both me and Mark can answer and stuff. Can't be like one-sided and stuff. Uh, it's, it should be uh, something. Don't ask like, hey, man, you had a heart attack. What's that like? I've already talked about that. <laughs> but I will talk about it more if anyone's really interested. Um, <laughs> But, no uh, but let's uh, keep it to something we can both discuss and stuff. So that being said, we turn to JC, proprietor of this fucking fine establishment that's coming, Villainy Cantina, and we say, uh, who's our first victim, sir? And we meet... Hey, guys. Hey, what's your name? My name is Miles. What is hey, it? Miles. Miles. Give it up for Miles, everybody. My what's on your mind, sir? Well, I just want to say hi. Hi. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with my lady, Isabel. Hey, hey, are you both from Milwaukee? Well, she's from Sheboygan, but kind of. It's like um, the same area. Milwaukee, home of the bronze Fonz statue, right? For sure, for sure. Wow. You could see a fucking bronze version of Fonzie just I mean, standing there, take pictures with it and shit. I just wanted to quick give a shout out to Alex Scott and Brandon Evans back at home, the Fortress of Solid Dude podcast buddies. That's, what is the name of your podcast? The Fortress of Solid Dudes. That is a fucking, that's wow. a genius title. Thank you. Well done. My friend Jordan was like, that's the dumbest shit ever. No, and that's good. Well, that's good. Fuck that, you, Jordan. <laughs> it's no, a great podcast it. about geek stuff, but it could also be a fantastic gay porn title as well. It, it kind of Fortress is. Fortress of Solid it kind Dudes. Of is. That is a solid kind of laying is. pipe title. <laughs> All right, what do you want to know, Miles? Well, my main question is, Infinity Wars is coming up. And man, I gotta say, I, Kevin, I love your stuff. I love Mark Bernard, and you Thank guys are you. fucking funny. You basically are like the new Jay and Son Bob for me. I love you guys. <laughs> Don't tell Jason Muse that. <laughs> You'll break his fucking heart. <laughs> I mean, I love Jay as well. But I guess my question for Mark and Kevin would be: I guess Infinity Wars, the next two are gonna, or the next two Avengers movies are gonna kind of wrap up the Avengers. And I feel like you guys are talking about how Chris Evans is out. I feel like Downey's gonna go out, or at least they're gonna send him off. How I think one of my favorite parts of the podcast is when you guys just kind of riff and just like, oh, what if the movie fucking went this direction? How would you both individually want to see Downey and Evans go down in the Avengers? On each other. Or at least... <laughs> <laughs> That's how you end the universe, God damn man. It. In your fortress of solid dudes. Yes. That goes down. <laughs> They're like, we fucking beat Thanos. What should we do? Shwarma? Fuck that. Come here. Whoa. <laughs> God damn it. Um, what would I do? What a great question. What would I do? Uh, I feel Tony, and not should die, but oh my God, that would be crazy satisfying if they do kill him off. And I've always said, I hope he becomes the AI inside the next suit. So I don't think so. He becomes Jarvis. Oh my God, how could they not? It'll be the easiest job in the world for him to do. He'll show up at a, at a fucking ADR joint and loop for about an hour, just get to be himself as long as the lines help the fucking plot forward and still be a part of that world. And it would be very Tony Stark to like, I downloaded my intelligence or blah, 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 and, and created like a Jarvis, like him himself as a fucking Jarvis, Tony instead. So uh, I, I hope they, I'm not hope they kill him. I'm, I'd be okay with they kill him as long as he remains the voice of the suit. If they kill him and he's not the voice of the suit, then they've got some splaining to do. 
Because uh, those movies, Robert Downey Jr. is like the crucial ingredient. You know how you can't have fucking soup without water? He's water, and that doesn't sound like a compliment, but he's like the basis of all living things. Um, him, he's magic in those movies, so I would hate to see him go away entirely. So I'd like to see that. Well, I don't, wouldn't like to, but if I had to do it myself, Thanos beat fuck out of Tony Stark, you know, to death, absolutely. No. And the AI, he becomes the AI in the suit for whoever picks it up next. You? Uh, I think that Thanos would almost beat Tony to death, except that Steve Rogers steps in oh. and does... <laughs> Saves his life, saves his sacrifices life. his life, because uh-huh. it goes back to that line He's about the like man I lay down on the wire so another guy can crawl over. That's what Steve Rogers is. And they do nice callbacks in those movies. They oh, always God. remember that shit. Oh I, God, that made that, you're gonna make me want to cry. That's powerful. That, I hadn't thought about that. And Maybe th- Cap is saving fucking Iron Man's life. And I think that that Marvel is introducing. There needs to be a captain leading the Avengers, and Marvel is giving us a captain in Captain Marvel. I see, I see no reason why you can't cross those timelines and absolutely Captain Marvel could lead the Avengers. If you guys in the comics, you could do it here. Yeah, let's not be mistaken. I don't think Avengers movies are going to stop. They're going to keep making them. I just think this iteration of the Avengers looks destined for doom. Uh, yeah. But they've earned it. It's not a cheap fucking gimmick. We've had these characters, a lot of them, for 10 fucking years at this point uh, in some cases. So we built up relationships with them. We're tied into them emotionally. So we're going to make that movie so satisfying, you know, in a world where some of those characters are going to drop. That was always one of the biggest complaints about these movies. There's no fucking stakes. Everybody lives forever. Sounds like it's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> not so much. Yeah. All right, could great I, question. You get to let's I, give it up for him later. Could I tell you what the fuck I think should fucking happen, but I don't think they're going to fucking do? No, give it up for him, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no. Tell us. Tell us. I was joking. Come on, Miles. We told you ours. You tell. You. Go, go, go. Okay. They're not going to do this, but fucking Doctor Strange is the time gem. Yes. I saw saw a fucking YouTube video where fucking Tom Holland and him were in a fucking interview together, and they were like, dude, we can't tell you about it, but we're in the movie a lot together, and it's really funny. My theory, Spider-Man's going to get his ass kicked, and then fucking Pepper Potts is going to be like, let's save the day in an Iron Man 3 suit. She'll die. Doctor Strange is like, let's fucking time travel, man. They fucking leave the movie. Gone. post credit scene, they fuck up time, and they come back and they're like, what the fuck's up with the Avengers Tower? And there's a big four on it. Boom. Oh my God, man! <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> you can drop the mic. I want to see that movie. Give it up for him, man. Oh, come get your tickets. Miles. 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 Go see a movie. You earned it. Well done. Don't leave me hanging. Well done. Fuck. Fantastic Four. So Avengers Tower becomes a Baxter building. Fuck, that's good. All right, man. Second question. You got to follow that. What's your name? Hi, uh, my name is Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Great hat. Uh, Give it up for Charlie, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, guys. Uh, First, before I ask my question, I just have to say thank you. Uh, You inspired me to become a filmmaker, to come here to Los Angeles, and to meet my fiance who's over there. Oh, shit! Right on, (laughs) man! Yay! When do you guys get married? Uh, We're probably going to get married when we can afford it. Ah, smart. Yeah. Have you thought about crime? Yes. (laughs) It's going to be a costume party, so it's going to be pretty dope. Fucking A, man. Yeah, and uh, Mark, I did bring you, I work in a theater, and uh, I was able to grab some of the uh, big vinyl Black Panther posters. What? So it's right behind you with a little note from uh, me and my fiance saying thank you guys. Oh, it's one of the big ones. Yeah, it's a full six foot poster made out of vinyl. It's two sided. Don't look at the back side. It's a wrinkle in time. So That's cool. That works but, yeah. both ways. If it's cool with my wife, I'm going to put it up in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> right on the ceiling? Yeah. Like, everything's better. <laughs> but, uh, that's beautiful, man. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, I was a journalist for a while, and I just Familiar wanted to know, uh, for, um, I was in the Marines, I was a photojournalist in the Marines. You were in the Marines as well? Thank yes, you sir. for your service. Fucking oh, thanks, Give it man. up for him, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just want to know, because uh, journalism sort of influenced my sort of creativity, how has journalism for Mark how, helped out with your creativity with writing comics and you've been working on scripts and stuff like that working your way into that world Mm -hmm. and kevin you're kind of a journalist now with all the interviews i mean hundreds of hundreds of interviews and how's that sort of affected you you would go first uh i think for me journalism 
helped more from a, from a work ethic perspective, I think. The fact that I've always worked for either a weekly magazine or a daily newspaper or an hourly website. The, fact, the idea of being precious about anything is gone because it's got to get done. Magazines got to go out. There can't be blank pages in this newspaper. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's good enough when it's done and it has to be done so I can do more. And the idea of being able to work with people you know, and learning how to interface with other people, and learning how to, to communicate and collaborate. Journalism is very much about that. It's not the, you know, the, the lone journalist on the front lines anymore. It's, there's a bunch of people in a newsroom, and we're all working together towards a common goal, which is a newspaper or a story or a whatever that is. But it's also, you know, and it also speaks to some of what he does, is it gives you an ear for dialogue, you know, being able to talk to people from all walks of life, from every possible place you could be from, learning to listen to how people talk from different places and learning what, like, dialogue on a page is different from dialogue as we speak. Like, we have a tendency to want to make it perfect, but people don't talk perfect. You know, they, they mangle sentences. They abuse grammar. I'll be honest with you. Andy fucking spoke perfect, man. I mean, he speaks better than I speak. <laughs> Credit to his fucking parents, yeah. man. Totally. But, but the idea that, that conversation is imperfect and nobody ever says what they mean Mm-hmm. is valuable when you're writing dialogue and trying to get to convey information in a way that feels real. Um, but yeah, it's those things. It's, it's learning how to work with people and learning how to listen to people. Uh, Josh Rausch, who shoots our Babylon show all the time and whatnot, he's been working on a documentary about uh, the late, great Michael Parks. Oh, wow. So uh, there's a recording of Parks, an interview I did with him at our theater, Smodcastle, years ago when it existed, and it's in the documentary. So Josh wanted to shoot at Smodcastle because there's no visuals for it. We didn't shoot Michael. There were no cameras or anything like that. So he wanted, rather than just you know putting up the sound, like context, the room, blah, 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 artsy shit. Mm-hmm. So he rented out the space that used to be Smodcastle for a couple hours, set up cameras, and, and we shot in there. So I got to go back to what was Smodcastle, and um, I, I was kind of like... It was an emotional moment because I realized, oh shit, quite like Quick Stop, I owe so much of my current career to this building. Quick Stop built who I was for like the first 10 years and stuff. Um, Smodcastle built who I've been for the last nearly 10 years at this point. Live podcasting, sitting down talking to people. So I mentioned this to my wife today. Um, I came home and sat down and she made the mistake of being like, how you doing? And it started like an hour conversation and shit where I was like, you know, being in that space reminded me of like, you know, me starting this journey where I wanted to talk a lot. Like I thought I'd become a better public speaker if I was doing all these podcasts, but I could sit down and meet people and find out how they got to where they got to. And sometimes you're sitting down with very like-minded individuals and sometimes not at all, but you get to speak to people that took a journey. And and I took a journey as well, so I'm always trying to get to the bottom of that. And I like to meet others and like, how'd you do it? And wh- where'd that come from and stuff? Because, uh, you know, regardless of what I did in my career and whatnot, I will always remain first and foremost a fan. Like when people do shit, I'm like, how'd you do that? That's fucking amazing, man. How do you rise to the top of your field? Or how'd you even get noticed in a world of fucking choices? So what journalism has done for me, and certainly not the written kind of journalism, I've written a few articles, but I would never consider myself like a, a, a journalist in print, but talking to people, interview them, mm-hmm. it helps you become a better storyteller because you, you're trying to keep a story on the rails at all times because you jump in, you're making jokes, they're going off on tangents, and the whole time I'm always listening and in the back, listening for the thread like I got to bring us I start this conversation and I eventually got to bring us to somewhere where it's satisfying and makes sense and there's an arc and it's like oh shit I've heard of a small version bless you of this person's journey so it's taught me to listen better and to find the plot points so the story can like kind of be cohesive for everybody else who's listening so if you listen to me on the podcast sometimes I'll be interviewing people and I will explain, like they'll say something that they take for granted, other people will know, and I'm like, well, my audience doesn't necessarily know this, so I'll jump in and editorialize and then fucking jump back out and stuff. So it's made me a better storyteller, oddly enough. That's a great question, man. Give yeah. it up for him, he gets tickets. <laughs> Excellent shirt, excellent hat. Uh, all right, JC, where are we going next? 
Sorry. Is this one? No problem. I did sign it. That's my signature on it. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. How Hi. are you? Good, how are you? Good. What's your name? I'm Jesse Earl. Give it up for Jesse, everybody. <laughs> what can we do you for? Well, I wanted to ask you, so with Infinity War coming out, it's obviously the big culmination of the big cinematic universe. I want to ask you guys, just for fun, if I was kind of disappointed with uh, the dark universe that we didn't get to have a cinematic universe that was about something other than superheroes, as much as I love superheroes. Mm -hmm. So if you could make a cinematic universe, what would it be if it wasn't superhero superheroes, and what would be the culmination of that cinematic universe? Uh, I have always thought that there was more life in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen than we've ever gotten. I think that idea is so crystalline and beautiful and lovely and heartbreaking mm -hmm. that we only ever got a bad movie version of it kind mm -hmm. of destroys me inside a little bit. But I would love to be able to reunite all of those sort of Victorian heroes and Victorian villains and, and put it to work for real. You know, build, build that out. And then, you know, have them, I don't know, interact with Shakespearean characters, because why not? That's all public domain. Absolutely. Like, no reason why Titania couldn't show up in, in, <laughs> in Victorian England. <laughs> I know, there's a lot of years apart, but I don't care. Fairies. Time travel, it'd be great. Fairies and, and magic. It's all <laughs> magic anyway. Um, but yeah, like that, that if, if anybody gave me the rights to that, I think we could have a good time. Um, last week, I think, I mean, there was a variation of this where I was like, uh, Hot Wheels, which was so stupid. Um, I thought about it over the course of the last week. I was like, why did I fucking say that? Like, what would I really, what do I think could be a fucking universe? Like a movie, uh, like a, 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 a series of movies that sustain a storyline with characters that have history with the audience. Now, you create something like Pacific Rim, you're starting something from scratch, this new uh, IP, and suddenly you don't know if it's gonna connect, fingers crossed and stuff. Now they've released the sequel, it opened number one and stuff, Mark says he dug it. So they're on their way to building universe. But what everyone wants is like, hey man, those rush of characters from your childhood. You know, because they're counting on your kids' money, but they're counting on your money more so. Like that's how they get us with these Marvel movies. It's like, oh my God, this is the fountain of youth and shit. So you need something that, you can't just start from scratch, you need something that has nostalgia built into it. Mm -hmm. Something that everybody, every uh, child at one point was familiar with. Breakfast cereal pitchman. The Trix Rabbit, Coco, Sonny the Cocoa Puffs Bird, the Rice Krispy Kids, the Bee from fucking Frankenberry, the Monster Cereals. Like, there are a lot of us, these characters raised us and built our <laughs> bodies and shit like that. So I think you could totally make a fucking crossover fuck off universe with all those characters. And on top of it, it's just one fat commercial for unhealthy American food. <laughs> so I, I would, if somebody was like, you can do anything you want, I'd be like, I want to do all the fucking, and that includes crossing universes like Kellogg's is going to meet the post characters and shit like that. <laughs> For the first time, so that's what I would do. Breakfast here. You also get like you get the, like an addiction metaphor with like uh, the tricked rabbit and Cookie Crisp guy, and like everyone's talking. They about fuck with everything they'll do. Where's for my Lucky Charms? Exactly. Where's my fucking Lucky Charms? <laughs> that's at the heart of the fucking mystery. What happened to Lucky's pot of gold and shit like that? I, I um, also still think that you know, call back to an old episode of Smodcast, but World War Seuss. Yes. Is still pretty strong. That's true. World War Seuss. Every Seuss <laughs> character crossing over and shit like that. <laughs> World War Seuss. That was a great question. Did you give your answer? I did. I yeah. gave mine. He wins tickets. Give it up for him, ladies and gentlemen. Well done, Jesse. Great job. Pleasure. Would the bad guy be Chester Cheetah? Ooh. Cheeto, Chester Cheeto would be the bad guy in that universe. And it, you're like, crossing him over with serial killers. Like the chip guy? Would listen, be the bad listen, guy. Listen, my shit's theory. pure. Keep your fucking Cheeto <laughs> out of this. I mean, Captain Crunch is your hero, though, right? I mean, I you could got do this enough, all day. You got enough. Yeah, you got enough characters in the serial universe. You don't even have to bother with the snack people and shit like that. That's in the sequel. That's when you bring in the Keebler elves. How are you, sir? What's your name? Hi, my name's EJ. Thanks for uh, give it up for time, EJ. First time, long time. EJ, Thanks right on. Thank first you, time. Thank you. You're wearing a Volgathon shirt from 2005. 2005. You were uh, there? Vintage, I was there the whole day. 
It was a lot of fun, so I, I dug this out of my uh, uh It's beautiful to see. I love that shirt. For those that don't follow this sort of thing, um, we used to hold film festivals all the time. I don't know why we haven't done it in recent years. I guess maybe because the movies I'm making are so fucking stupid. But uh, <laughs> we used to hold these film festivals. We did them in the East, on the East Coast in Red Bank all the time called Vulgarthon, where we'd show like, you know, all the movies we ever made. So when I came out here in 2002, we opened up a Jay and Silent Bob Secret Stash in Westwood at one point, and uh, me and Bob Chapman at Graffiti Designs uh, held a, 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 a Vulgarthon out here. And, you know, we were like, where, where to do it? Because you can rent to any fucking theater. So I said, let's rent the Cinerama Dome. So we rented the Cinerama Dome and held it for all day long and showed like a series of fucking flicks. I can't remember which ones, but I remember we showed a long ass cut of Jersey Girl. And at first people were like, no, but then they liked it like after, after we were done. Um, it Q was wonderful. Too. Q and A's with Affleck was there. And That's stuff. right. Affleck showed up and Jason <laughs> Lee and Joey was there and stuff. We did the 20, I think like an anniversary of Chasing Amy was around that time, so we shot I'm the all rats, you did a 10 year anniversary, I have that t-shirt too. Oh, well, you went to that as well. <laughs> yeah. Fuck man, that was a great fucking event. And, but they changed the rules of the, of, of the Cinerama Dome from there forward. Because when we got it, we rented it. Like I was like, how much is it to rent the Cinerama Dome for the day? And I, it was 8,000 bucks. So they're like, 8,000. I was like, I have it for the whole day for 8,000. I can do anything I want. They're like, well, don't fuck in it. But yes, like, yeah, <laughs> it's yours. So I said, fantastic. And, you know, I think they were fucking stoked for the 8,000 bucks. Like, can you believe somebody rented this fucking joint and shit? But I sold tickets, like, on my website and shit. And the tickets, like, more than paid for the, the, for the rental of the joint. Yeah. And so when the tickets, like, sold out and the tickets were, like, 80 bucks a pop or whatever, and that place seats a couple hundred fucking people, like the event was making money. And so we got a call from the person who was running it at that point going, oh, well, we didn't know you were gonna sell tickets to an event in the <laughs> dome. And I said, what'd you think I was renting it for? The fuck? <laughs> like, no, of course I'm gonna have an event and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, well, we just feel like, you know, maybe we should receive part of that gate. And I was like, oh, but we don't, that's not in the agreement at all. Like I, I rented this place, I four wall in it, for eight grand, I, I get to keep all the money and stuff. And they were pissed about it and they changed their policy after that. So if you ever rent that place, then they get a piece of the gate as well. It was just smart for them and stuff. And I didn't beat them at their game, it's just that wasn't a requirement because how many people ever walked in and said, I'll rent the fucking joint. But I knew we had a way to fill the joint as well. So um, whenever I look at that shirt, or whenever I go to the Arclight or the Cinerama Dome, I always feel like when I walk in, they're like, there he is, the piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Changed everything for everybody. In any event, what's your question, sir? Well, uh, before I get to it, may I plug my podcast? Oh, my God, is that please. Okay? Absolutely. What's uh, your podcast it's, called? It's called Scratch the Surface. It's on iTunes and iHeartRadio, and it's uh, mostly an in-depth... Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, it's mostly an in-depth interview podcast with uh, comic book writers, dr uh, drawers, uh, actors, directors, writers, all, oh, all sorts of people. Uh, it's Stephen Denight, the uh, director of Ooh, Pacific Rim. Cool. He's coming up, uh, featured guest, Vincent D'Onofrio, uh, upcoming guest. You're gonna get the kingpin himself. Yes, okay. sir, yes, sir. Uh, but my question is, um, so uh, Homecoming kind of set up, I think, a Sinister Six possible movie. Yeah, certainly um, with the introduction of a vulture and the scorpion as well. Yeah. And uh, Drew Goddard was pulled from Daredevil season one to write a Sinister Six movie, which looked like it was going to get scrapped because the Spider-Man was, you know, that. Because it was part of the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man yep, movie. Yeah, but they, maybe they'll still use part of that script since they paid for it. But who would you guys like to see as your Sinister Six is my question. Uh, Mysterio, all six characters. <laughs> Um, honestly, I, of course, Vulture, a great addition. They teased us with Scorpion, so I'd take him as well. Uh, I'm, I'm no kidding. I think Mysterio is a villain that lends himself to movies. Like, he's master of fucking, uh, you know, the mystery, illusion and, illusion and movie magic. And his character, Quentin Beck, came from fucking movies and stuff. So definitely Mysterio. I want Rhino. Yeah. I actually, I know a lot of people shit on that movie, but I like their version of... Rhino with uh, Paul, Giamatti. Paul Giamatti in a like what well, essentially like a transformer suit. Yeah. yeah. See, I like the I like the version of him as a giant bruiser who is 
molecularly bonded to a suit. Yeah, that's like the, what it was when I was a kid. Yeah, like the tragedy of a dude who has to spend his entire life in a rhino suit. <laughs> like, imagine just waking up like, all right, I'm going to try and go get a job. No wonder he's so pissed. Except for the stupid suit with the horn and everything. I'd like to be married again, but I got the stupid suit with the horn. Like, just every day is another series of assaults on his sense of humanity because he's bonded into a dumb gray suit. And he has to live with people constantly being like, do I make you horny? (laughs) And he's like, I fucking hate that joke and I hate fucking Austin Powers. Rage! Um, All right, so we got got Vulture. Mm -hmm. We got Scorpion. Scorpion, We got Mysterio. We got Rhino. Electro? Venom? Venom? I mean, yeah, but they tried that once, mm-hmm. and their interpretation wasn't great. But the, you know, if they put him in the fucking big star mask, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but let's we'll we'll table that for a moment, and keep going. He's got a deep bench. Yeah. Craven. Oh, Craven the Hunter. Woo! Yes, absolutely. Because yeah. then it sets you up for doing fearful symmetry one day, Doc which is such a great story. I was thinking, do we need a goblin? We've seen so many fucking green goblins and hobgoblins in all these Spider-Man movies. So maybe we table Green Goblin and Hobgoblin for the moment. Octopus? Dr. Octopus? Fucking Dr. Octopus. There's a character that lends himself to cinematic interpretation. And they did a great job with that character before. Why not fucking keep it going? All right, so that's five. I don't know. I thought we had six. I thought we had six. You can go up to ten. That was six? (laughs) Yeah. Mysterio. Vulture. Vulture. Scorpion. Scorpion. Rhino. Rhino. Um, Craven. Craven. Doc Ock. Doc Ock. Yeah, that's pretty fucking cool. I feel like in the movie they're setting up Shocker as being one of them. <laughs> I mean, all right, I take it. That character wasn't bad. Yeah. Um, but, you know, fuck, they got a, as, uh, as I said, a deep bench, a deep toy box of yeah. like Spidey rogues. His, his rogues gallery probably as good as Batman's rogues gallery. So they can kind of do shit like. Crazy Quilt, the man with the x ray eyes. <laughs> or what is the, what is the guy. Is, um, the team of dudes in Spider-Man. One's tall, one's got a cowboy hat and shit like that. Fuck, I forget I their name, the somethings. Um, they, could, they haven't even touched that. Uh, There's so many characters they've never gone fucking near. So I don't know, those are my six. No, no we collaborated on those We six. collaborated. Great question. Right, you went to fucking tickets. Thanks, Give it up for him, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we got one the set of tickets podcast left. again is called what? Scratch the surface. surface. Go check it out. Okay, man. Final question of the evening. What's your name, sir? Mr. My name's Corey. Lots of pressure. Hi. There's a lot of pressure. Give it up, Corey, everybody. Corey's going to take us home. What do you got for us, Corey? So, Kevin, you've been absolutely a huge part of the CW and us getting on board with it and staying on board with the CW. Mark, your writing skills are incomparable. we give you guys the uh, torch and say, okay, uh, CW says six episodes of any character. Mark, who do you write? And do you let Kevin direct it? Uh, <laughs> not if you want it to succeed, my friend. Uh, six episodes of any character in the DC universe, I'm assuming, right? Because it's got to be on CW. Um, I do Challenges of the Unknown. Yeah, they're living on borrowed time. Yeah, I think, I think some big, giant, cosmic space traveling pulp heroes you know done right done today like Indiana Jones meets Fantastic Four why would you not watch six episodes of that and he can direct all of them look at that excellent oh, thank you yay um, that's a good poll let me think I always say the question so I'll put that on the shelf for the moment uh, but I believe the question would be the one I go for but in a world where they're like you can't do it let me think what else in DC oh fucking you know, some of my favorite comics uh, of, of my youth uh, was JLI, you know, Justice League International and JLA, Justice League America, but it was just called Justice League with, uh, Ke- what's his name? Um, the funny version. Kevin oh, McGuire. Kevin McGuire and, and yeah. Dematis. Giffen. 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 That was the name. Fuck. De- the Giffen, Dematis, and what was the McGuire. Name? And McGuire. Such a magical run of the book. And they even made Dark Batman work in a comedic sense. Like, they played, they played up his whole, like, now he's the Dark Knight and shit like that. Um, I thought they did a fantastic job. So I would say you could take 
Uh, of that world, of course, two of the most beloved characters were Blue Beetle and Booster Gold. And you could do an excellent fucking ongoing series with those characters. One guy who's like, you know, Batman, but not Bruce Wayne and stuff. Ted Kord has his own fucking industry and created the fucking Blue Beetle suit and stuff. I wouldn't do the modern one with the scarab beetle that turns him into a beetle. I like it, but I kind of like the idea of like, I'm a tech billionaire and I just decided to start fighting crime and stuff. That's, that's tried and true origin story in the comics. Batman, Green Arrow, same thing. I'm a billionaire and I just want to do what's right. So that character is wonderful. And then you get Booster Gold who comes back from the fucking future with information. That's what makes him a superhero and stuff. And he's got to try to learn how to be a decent human being. You get a totally fucking great series out of that, man. Put Nathan Fillion in the role of Booster Gold. <laughs> that fucking right amount of Canadian swagger. <laughs> Does that mean Tudyk gets the the uh, Blue Beetle role? Uh, that would be fantastic. You and me, we're gonna rule the CW. That's <laughs> such a great idea. Every episode. A little bit of Two Dick as well, man, because fucking Two Dick better than One Dick, and he's very, <laughs> very fucking funny. That is those two dudes, man. They are fucking uh, Blue Beetle and Booster Gold to some degree. They're waiting for some Kevin Smith dialogue. No, for sure. they're doing quite well without Kevin Smith. They're like, we got Joss Whedon, motherfucker. <laughs> Great question. Give it up for him, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Corey. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Uh, oh, fuck. These are for me. Looking great. Oh, shit. I get to take this stuff home? Thank you. I like coming here because I get free shit. I got Black Panther, though. I know. You got the biggest free thing. Fuck. It's life-size and shit. That poster's yeah. taller than you. I know. I'm going to need a friggin' step And I'm stool. not impugning your height. I think you were made perfectly. <laughs> That's what every mother wants to hear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, have you had a good time this evening? I uh, can't thank you enough for coming out, man. Uh, give it up for our good friends here at the, at the Scum and Villainy Cantina for giving us a fucking home. And give it up for the man to my love without whom there ain't no fat man on Batman, Mr. Mark Bernardin. And that, yeah. that is Fat Man on Batman this week. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernard. Uh, tune in next week, same fat time, same fat channel, smodcast.com or youtube.com slash Kevin Smith. Give it up for Mark's mom, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! <laughs>